Hi, Del Rio. Maven. RFM, Maven. How's everybody How doing tonight? Life is good. I, <laughs> I'm really well, yeah, nervous. Life is, yeah, life is really good unless you're named, I don't know, M. Russell Ballard. <laughs> or any Ballard for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Maven, been a crazy why, week. Why are you extra nervous? Me? Um, Maven. Because oh, I, Maven. Go ahead. I was put in charge of the show tonight. Yeah, you've got an action-packed episode for us, and I'm super excited. Okay. <laughs> I'm super it's a first. It's a Maven show tonight. She has picked the subject matter. She has done the research. She has organized it. Great so story, if folks. It, it's going to be great. And if it flops, then it's all on you, Maven. No pressure. <laughs> yep. It's all, <laughs> it'll be all my fault. So I need to share my screen, and I will just die i think if the audio isn't good tonight because it kind of we've got a lot of video clips that we're going over so um uh, yeah i'll go ahead and add this on here we go so just really quick this is going to be about the episode that mormonism or um, mormon stories did with adam steed and uh, it's a six hour long episode it's six hours long for good reason there's there's really a lot going on here and um so what the what i was hoping to do tonight was first of all this can maybe hopefully be a shortened version of that i've been just in this interview for hours and hours really just being harsh with the cutting tool to get this down but what what struck me as we were going through this and i think people in the chat will agree is just the the level and the of of failures along the way, not just the, the failures to do the right thing, but then also deliberate malicious acts from other leaders in the LDS church. All along the way, this poor man has been uh, victimized by church leaders from the age of 14 um, until now. And uh, Jody Hildebrandt, um, who's been in the news for child abuse recently is a big part of that. And there's just, there's just so many connections like all along, all through the line. So Anyway, um, yeah, let's, uh, shall we get started or do we have any uh, commentary from you guys about this before we jump in? Uh, nothing from me. I did listen to the majority of this interview two days ago in preparation for tonight. And what a traumatic story. And uh, I'm always, you know, just from a psychology standpoint, I'm always interested in kind of boundaries of what healthy institutions and unhealthy institutions do. And Tonight, Maven, I'm obviously a lot of unhealthy stuff. Yeah, and I think actually that's a good point to bring up first is that while I try to cut out most of the things that are a bit more explicit, we are talking about really tough subjects tonight. So anyone, uh, I guess a content warning, um, we are talking about child abuse, uh, especially in the Boy Scouts, which is what happened to Adam. Um, and then we'll also be talking, there will be mentions of people who uh, other child abuse victims, you know, of this time and of this scout camp that, um, you know, end up ending things for themselves because of the pain. So those are, I guess those, that those are some content that we will be going over briefly, not gratuitously, but just as a, as aware, um, this is a really, really tough story. And if you, like I said, I, I cut out a lot of the explicit details in, um, how his life was kind of systemically just destroyed by all of these people. Um, if you do watch the full episode, you are going to get a lot more explicit information about uh, things that happen uh, with him and his own children. So, OK, I think we've got everything covered as far as that goes. Um, so just wanted to, I guess, be safe and give everyone a heads up. So I think um, let's go. This is the first clip. This will be like a, a real quick um, overview. So I'll just go ahead and play it. And this will also be our test uh, if the chat can let me know that the audio is okay. I don't hear it. No? I don't hear it. No? Okay. Mm -mm. It, it's... Um, I'm going to try to represent because it says I'm doing the screen and it says to share the tab audio. Nope. It wasn't. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Were you going to say something, Bill? No, I just was going to see if there's any way I could be of help to you. I think the um, StreamYard changed the button, so it looked like I had turned it on when I had, in fact, not. So let's try this again one more time. 
I'll give just a quick brief overview. Adam Paul Steed was raised Mormon. He was abused as an LDS Boy Scout. He um, became a nationally known whistleblower, uh, speaking out against his abuser and then teaming with his father to change Idaho law uh, to change the statute of limitations laws surrounding sexual abuse of children in the state of Idaho, uh, particularly related to the Mormon Church and Boy Scouts as sort of the impetus. So Adam Paul Steed would be worthy of a Mormon Stories interview just for that alone, but the story gets more tragic because uh, later when Adam Paul Steed marries, uh, he goes to BYU, Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, and miraculously or um, suspiciously, he's assigned to Jody Hildebrandt um, by his Mormon bishop to help him with his marriage. And uh, for those of you who know that at some point around 2012, Jody Hildebrandt's license was suspended for a time in Utah as a therapist. This was in relation to Adam Paul Steed's case, where among other even more egregious violations uh, that I believe includes manufacturing or altering of evidence, um, Jody Hildebrandt's license was suspended for, um, you know, violating Adam Paul Steed's client patient uh, confidentiality, reporting him to the honor code. But more importantly, it just appears as though Jody Hildebrandt tried to destroy both Adam Paul Steed's um, marriage and his life. And uh, I think you'll hear about the inappropriate relationship that Jody Hildebrandt predictably um, nurtured with, with Adam Paul Steed's ex-wife. And there, even most disturbingly of all, there's a connection involving multiple general authorities Okay, so um, you can leave it up. I'm just going to go ahead to the... I'll give just a quick brief... Over Sorry. Next slide here. So these are the two that he's talking about. Um, Chris is, is short for Christian. So first, uh, we're going to be talking about Harold Hillam, uh, who has passed. Um, but Harold was uh, in charge of the Teton Peaks. He was the Teton Peaks Council president. And um, we're going to get into that a little bit. So this is this is not something that Adam finds out for a very, very long time um, until I, actually, until his death. It's, it was in his obituary that he found this out. And I found that to be a very interesting detail considering the aftermath of everything. And maybe we can go into it later. But um, I did notice a lot. Of, I, there were so many articles about this. There's so much coverage of this. It's been in, in documentaries, uh, more than one. And, um, and yeah, just a lot of news sources. And I... It was interesting to me how many times news sources would say something like uh, high level leaders in the Mormon church or like top level leaders in the scouts. There are so many times where specific names weren't given. And I and I get maybe why um, maybe it's a journalism thing. Maybe people can sound off in the comments. Um, it just happened so much. And I think it's for that kind of a reason that. I think somebody like Adam could go for so long in his life and not know that someone was, you know, behind it or had this level of authority somewhere along the way. I just found it very strange. I don't know. Do you either of you have a comment on that? Just to I guess, reiterate what you're saying, the idea that as Adam is dealing with abuse in his uh, in the Boy Scouts that he is right. participating in. That as all the of incident, this back and forth is going on, yep, as all of it's going on, Harold Hillam plays a role in that, but and he's also playing a role in Adam's church life, and Adam never has the information to put two and two together. Right. Not a direct role in the church life, but it, he does come up throughout. And I and I guess it's just interesting to me, not just that Adam didn't know, but just how often in in reporting for sure by the church, but even by other sources that it, a really generic term like high level leaders is used. So you don't know who and you don't know what the actual position is. So you can't try to go and find out specifically. Um, anyway, that does come into play later. And then Chris Kleiwig, um, is uh, was called to the as a general uh, area general authority by Elder Hillam. So there's this 
connection here and uh, Chris Kleiwig's daughters who Adam ends up marrying. So it's, there's just a lot of convolutedness here. So we'll, we'll come back to these guys. But uh, also with um, Harold Hillam, in, so I have his uh, callings here on the screen. So if there's anyone listening, first of all, I've got listed the uh, Teton Peaks Council President for Boy Scouts of America. And then under Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he is in the presidency of the 70. And he was also Sunday School General President during this time. And I, be I believe he was in charge of a lot of handbook changes, which also involved uh, how bishops respond to abuse. Maybe that's a topic for another day, but I, I feel confident enough in that to, to say that, that he was uh, around some of these changes. Uh, he was there for a long time, and this is when those changes happened. So um, uh, going on, so I, this is just, just kind of a really quick overview of kind of three main sections that I put this into. So... First will be Boy Scouts and Idaho law. And then a second will be his marriage, the therapy. This is where Jody Hildebrandt comes in. Um, and then also where his marriage breaks down. And then the role of BYU, uh, specifically the honor code, but there was also some shenanigan shenanigans with the police department and the counseling center and uh, Adam's fight for parental rights. So that's kind of the quick overview. So we'll go ahead and dive into a camp or a camp little Lemhi. I, I think that's how it said. And um, even in the ex-Mormon subreddit recently this week, I don't have it ready to pull up um, and Bill might be able to get it quickly, but there was someone that posted that they had also been uh, abused here. And there were a lot of really troubling stories from the comments also responding to similar things. So it's just a a really, a really sad thing. And, and the Grand Teton Council, this is where this camp was located. So I'm going to play a, uh, oh, sorry, I wasn't going along here. So this, these are the three sections here. Here's um, just a, a picture of the sign at Camp Lemhi and the Grand Teton Council, um, uh, well, I guess, logo. So, um, and then I have listed on the side, if you're, um, for those listening, uh, the names of the leaders. And so these guys will be coming up multiple times. Uh, Brad Stowell is the abuser. There's Elias Lopez, Brad Allen, and Kim Hansen. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then I, I, at that point, I absolutely knew what was going on, but I just couldn't like digest it everyone was saying he was a seminary teacher he was trying out for to be a seminary teacher and he was in their program and and such a role model of mine and confidant and he was going to go to well, he had all these plans to take me to scout camp and I, I still just couldn't like get out of it and i didn't know how to confront it I, you know i act like i was sleeping and i just so i ended up going to scout camp and more abuse happened while he was taking me there Camp Little Lemhi taking me there ahead of time to uh, get camp ready. And there was some really bad sexual abuse that happened in the cabin by the lake there. And once the camp was starting, you know, he was over camp, second in charge. And and I was making up excuses not to go. And so finally he started not paying attention to me and talking to my little brother and getting him all excited to go. And I, and I just couldn't bear the sight of my brother getting hurt. So, so I went, I wasn't ready to talk about what happened to me, but I wasn't ready to let my brother go alone with this terrible sexual predator. I'm just going to pause real quick. I'm, I saw a comment and it reminded me of something that I did want to explain a little bit about this. Um, the comment is, uh, I'll go ahead and put it up. Uh, this guy looks shattered. And that is part of the difficulty of watching this interview is seeing uh, on his face. And this interview actually happened in two separate days. It was meant to be just one day, but um, especially with Jody's information coming out and this, these child abuse things, Adam has been kind of thrust a little bit back in the spotlight and has been reliving, reliving trauma over and over. So the day that he started this interview with John, he is very shattered you it's it's clear and that was part of the difficulty in, in cutting up some of these clips was just normal human speaking anyway is is usually not prim and proper and and because adam is dealing with a lot i i did leave a few moments in just to kind of portray that but um he he ended up john ended up calling the interview off at i think about an hour and a half in 
and um, and having Adam come back. So you will see if you are watching, you'll see, uh, you know, he, he looks very different. He looks much, much better the second go around. He's wearing different clothes. And I kind of, and he does repeat a lot of things in the second one. So yeah, when I'm splicing things together, that's something that you might notice. And that's just the uh, quick explanation on why that is. So and, I, and, I'll go ahead. And, yeah. And just to note, Adam acknowledges as much throughout the interview, he acknowledges mm -hmm. that this life of, traumatic things that have happened to him affect his ability uh, in the interview. And uh, I, I just think just tremendously brave of him to to step yeah. forward and, and to be. John checks in with him. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill, go mm. ahead. Just, just, I was just gonna, yeah, go ahead. Just that um, to step forward to hold institutions accountable when to do so is going to continue more harm to yourself is just deeply brave and courageous. Yes, um, I'm glad you said that. Adam is doing all of this willingly. Uh, John checks in with him multiple times throughout the interview. And, um, <clears throat> and so he acknowledges it and he knows it's difficult, but I think you'll see hopefully through these clips and if you don't, you'll definitely see in that interview that Adam is the kind of person that will continually put himself in harm's way in order to help other people. And we see that in this clip just barely. Um, when he's trying to avoid his abuser, he starts focusing on his little brother. So he goes to camp because he's worried about his little brother. And so I feel like every step along the way that Adam is fighting, he's always doing it for others. And it comes as in, at intense personal cost, which he understands and is, is continuing to do and has chosen to do uh, today. So. Um, We'll go ahead and, and I'll play the rest of the clip. I went to Elias Lobos and 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 I and he knew something was wrong. I told him about the child abuse and and he he was in shock and couldn't believe it was possible with Brad and was just in shock and he was a nice guy but he was there without knowing and so he was putting me on the phone to his leaders that he would just follow whatever they said. There's Brad Allen and Kim Hansen and Brad Allen is on the phone with me talking me into a scenario where i won't tell my parents and i won't tell anybody about brad then i'm the week goes on and i i i'm out there gathering all these kids to stop this pre serial predator from hurting them and i'm 14 and it was dangerous then i'm back in there telling elias lopez this doesn't work and then the phone calls graduate to kim hansen who's over like the whole area and Kim Hansen is the one that really sealed the deal, making me promise never to tell my parents. And we had a discussion about how it could hurt the reputation of scouting and nobody would want to come here anymore. And I didn't want to feel guilty for ending this beautiful thing. So they didn't tell you to report it to the police? No, no, no. Let alone your own parents? No, no, no. But the abuse was getting worse. And I, I said, I am calling the police. And, and I called the police and the police came and they were just like, let's arrest him in front of the flag so all the kids know that this is a bad guy and they tackled him and put him in handcuffs and took him away. And I came home after, even after all that and writing up these factual testimonies of the child abuse and everything, I still wouldn't tell my parents because the leaders had so conditioned me into thinking that it would destroy everything. Okay. Um, Maybe. I just want to pull it down. Yeah, let's just do, here we go. Here's the button I think I want. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, you had those four names down there, and he's mentioned, or you have all four, and I understand that Brad, what was the last name? I don't see the list again. Um, it was Stowell. Stowell was the his abuser. Yeah. And the other people are yeah. who? Let me get, I actually have, um, I think I have a graphic here. Brad Stoll, Elias Lopez, Brad Allen, yes. and Kim Hansen. Scout. Whoops. Okay. I'm going to, let me just start get this back here. This is kind of, there we go. And I'm guessing that's a, a guy with the name Kim. Mm-hmm. Okay. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to keep you on, on top of all the things. Built. So, so these are the three. I didn't, I don't have, um, the abuser on here. These are just the the leaders. So, uh, yeah, like I said, Kim Kim Hansen actually has also passed uh, as as well as Elder Hillam. The other two though um, are still um, are still going. So we're gonna have some more 
clips to go through, but I guess if that's that's the visual and just kind of keep this in your in your guys's mind, we'll come back and we'll talk about them again later. Um, did you have another comment, uh, RFM, about that? No, that was it. I was just trying to keep all the players straight in my head. Okay. Um, let me get back to where I was in the thing. By the okay. way, Maven, if I ask you a question that you're going to answer later on, just say, hey, I'll we'll get to it later on. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So this is, uh, okay. Yeah. So this is kind of the aftermath. Um, so with, we ended with the last one with him calling the, the police. Was that right? Yes. Now and like, uh, apparently sure. they're arresting oh. uh, Brad at the they camp. They arrest him. Yeah. In front yes, of the flagpole. At the camp, in front of everybody. Yeah. They, they take him. So, all right. So uh, let's go ahead. Do you remember if any were LDS, like all scout leaders? All these people were LDS. That's all the, the thing. All the scout were... leaders. That that's the whole crazy part about it is, is that the scout leaders were all like professional scouters, so they've got their allegiance to scouting. But then they were all like Mormons too, and so they had their allegiance to Mormonism. And as the scouting story came out, what we started to find was, well, well first of all, uh, just real brief they were going to put Brad in jail for less than a week's time for each kid he abused. He plea bargained to 24 victims of sexual abuse, serial pedophile. 24 victims. 24 victims. He, he admitted. That he'd sexually abused while he was all scared and he admitted to it. My dad said to me, I know I don't want you to have to talk public or like for us to tell the news about this, but the, but the prosecutors for Brad Stoll's case are on the scouting board and they're going to let him go with less than, a, first they were going to try to have him not go to jail. My dad was so frustrated and he was on the phone and then it was, he's going to get a less than a week's time in jail for each victim he abused. My dad said, you, we've got to tell the story publicly so that these people can't do this. Okay. So just to, to check in there, uh, just as a quick recap, right? So we, we have that the abuse is happening, first of all. Um, he reports it to multiple leaders who tell him not only not to tell his parents, but obviously not to tell police. They promise at the camp that they'll take care of it and protect children, and they don't. And Adam in the full interview goes into more, again, more explicitly other children that were abused. And not just that, but how difficult it was for him to try, because this poor kid is 14 and he's trying to save his brother, but also all these other kids trying to protect them from an adult leader um, and it wasn't working. So it wasn't just like a one-off, this this poor kid, I don't know how he was even able to sleep while he was there. So yeah, so there was the cover up. Um, and then I have, let's see. Can, can I just a, add something here, Maven? Yeah. Uh, I think like most men in Mormonism, at one time I served as an assistant scout master for whatever, let's say two years. And what I what I quickly realized was that there's Boy Scouts of America, and then there's Boy Scouts of America and Mormonism. And they, like Adam is talking about, when I went to the annual Boy Scout camp, it's it's not like this Mormon group mixed in with other Boy Scout troops. It is it's a Mormon Boy Scout camp. It's all Mormonism across the entire camp, and we're talking. 30 troops or something, some, you know, immense amount. And so when he speaks to people have people who are listening, who are not uh, connected to Mormonism, they're sort of listening as outsiders recognize that there is the boy Scouts of America. They do their thing. And they also have abuse outside of Mormon boy Scout troops, but the local ward handles each local boy Scout troop. And then when those boys do big giant activities with other boy Scout troops, it's almost always in the realm of all Mormon Boy Scout troops. So for him to say like, it's all Mormon leaders and it's, and, and the people running the camp in these Mormon areas, it's, it's so connected to Mormonism that you would have a hard time untangling it. Right. And that's kind of what you're saying to like, all of the leaders are members of the church. And that really leads into a lot of, you know, other things that come up. I'm going to put this up on the stage. Um, this was, shoot, I didn't write it down. I think this was the article from the Daily Beast, and we will have these in the show notes on the website and everything. 
So this, these are some statements from these uh, leaders. So I'll actually, RFM, do you want to go ahead and, and read this? Sure thing. The Boy Scouts of America say they've made a few policy changes after the 1997 arrest of the former counselor, Brad Stowell, who pleaded guilty eight years ago to molesting two boys at Boy Scout Camp Little Lemhi in Swan Valley. Officials maintain that adequate policies are already in place to protect kids from abusers such as Stowell. I'll bet it's the gold standard, too. It continues, the, po the policies are good. Yeah, it's the gold standard. They're working it in there. The policies are good, and scout leaders obeyed them, said Kim Hansen, executive director of the Grand Teton Council, which oversees scouting in the region. I I'm sorry. When I see something like this, and you say the policies are good, and the scout leaders obeyed them, so why is this kid getting molested over and over and over again by the scout leader? Yeah, with 20-something other kids. And by the way, when you read that, you said they've made a few policy changes. It's actually they've made few policy changes. In other words, they have not made many changes. There isn't a need to. The policies in place take care of this, and they and they cover it, and there's nothing really here to see. It goes on further in that article. I should have gotten a screenshot of it, too. Um I don't know, Bill, if you maybe you have time to pull that up. You're always really good at like getting things up real quickly. But he goes on to say something like um, that he, they don't feel responsible for what Stoll did. And I think if it's not this article, it's another one. Uh, he takes credit for having contacted the parents and also for police, which I thought was pretty astounding. Um, and there's there's a Netflix special out right now called Scouts Honor. And I did watch that. I did take one clip from it, but something else that was in that, um, that uh, was not in Adam's interview specifically was, uh, and, and they show his picture as well, but uh, Kim Hansen, this uh, Brad Stoll had abused another child I way before, I wanna say it was like 20 years, like when, when Brad was a teenager, he had abused a very young child um, and that was known and Kim Hansen, according to, I think this was, this is in the Scouts Honor documentary, Kim Hansen, knew it back then so 24 years before um adam and and his brother are at the camp he knew what kind of person brad was so i just wanted to put that out there it's it's just astonishing to me that he could say something like this that um that they followed and and they there's nothing else they could have done so um yeah let's uh let's go to the next one here <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay. So this is the part, let me get this, we'll put this one up. This is where I, um, I steal a little bit from the documentary and, and hopefully it doesn't demonetize us. So if it, if it does, I guess donations appreciated, we'll put that here. And I, this is a kind of a step aside from what, um, from Adam's interview, but I did feel like it was worth talking about. And that was just homophobia in general, because it does play a really big role in a lot of the uh, abuse and cover-ups and well uh, just how the boy scouts tried to i guess sort of ineffectually fight that by equating um uh, homosexuality with abusers and just kind of the damage that that caused and it didn't help at all for reasons that we know are obvious now but let's go ahead and, and play that one scouts are an independent organization but felt that they had to honor the biases or perspectives of their sponsors and the Catholic Church and the Mormon Church is historically homophobic. I was uh, beat up. I was called homosexual all the time. Uh, I was um, I, I was laughed about at my school. Uh, I had a lot of friends and stuff, but there were times where, like, the, I remember one day where the whole school uh, came after me together, and like all these popular kids pushed me on the ground, and they were kicking me and outside people will say who the perpetrator is, oh, it's a gay problem, right? Gays are pedophiles. There's research that most perpetrators are straight men. I also think homophobia plays a really big role in why a lot of men can't come forward. It plays into their shame and pain and struggle. Okay. So that was just a really uh, brief clip on that, but I, I felt it was important to also bring attention to, I guess. So 
Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, let's go on to the next one. Let me get this back up here. So this is kind of in the aftermath. Um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and play it. Let's get this one. I'm 23. I'm at BYU. I started. I'm super excited. I want to date. I want to get married. I want in the temple. I want to have family. Or, you know, I served a mission. I, I want all this stuff. And just that kind of innocent life again. And then it got all fucked up again. Like I get called by my dad and he says, hey, this case finally closed on these two victims of abuse. And the and a reporter found out and he contacted us. He, wa he wanted to know if he could talk with you. And I said, Adam's had enough. Talk to the other 24 kids on the list of Brad Stoll's plea bargain. And he went to the courthouse and the list was missing. And he published something and I was I told it was made international news. And then suddenly they were like, there's a computer glitch. Here's the list. Now's the list of the 24 victims. Idaho had a three-year re reporting law. And, and Meaning, it was past the statute of limitations. Yeah. And now nobody would be responsible for hiding the, the child abuse victims because too many years had gone by. And, and my dad said in that same phone call, I said, one of the kids of the 24 was the son of a bishop in Idaho who just committed suicide. And he left a note that said he was sexually abused and no one believed him. And I just remember like, I knew what I had to do because I was grown up now. Or when you're grown up when you're 23, right? <laughs> but I wasn't 14. Then, um, sorry. So no, so back to BYU and yeah, and Zuckerman reaches out. I get these trauma moments and they just yeah. erase my mind. But just tell me the last thing I was saying and I'll get. I'll yeah, get so through. you knew the right thing to do with Zuckerman reaching out. Was... Yeah, yeah. It was I knew that I had to sue boy scouts of america so that i could get rid of uh money wasn't even a thought i i just had to get rid of the the same people that were working for boy scouts of america representing it to the church and the people in charge kim hansen that's the name i forgot kim hansen someone i talked to on the phone that made me promise not to tell my parents and and he was still working there and same with brad allen and 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 I knew there were victims out there that now I found out these kids I grew up with, they, you know, they never got contacted. They never got helped. And I saw a lot of the damage in their lives. And I just felt like, like I'm 23 and I was watching, I had enough time to watch their lives get really messed up. And I just thought that, okay, I'm going to sue so that I can get rid of these people, get them out of this institution of scouting. Thank you. <laughs> and so I um so the point that he was saying that he was he was hoping for was to get these guys who had done, you know, the leaders who were responsible out of scouting. And I I did some research on this, you know, on the side, and it was kind of sad to me, I think, uh that it didn't work. So while while he did sue, there was a settlement. I, I guess, I don't know if it's just part of the settlement that they all stayed in the scouts. So um, Hillam, or not Hillam, um, Kim Hansen's obituary shows that he was involved in scouting his, basically his whole entire life uh, up, up until his death. Um, the, uh, let me, let me bring up the pictures of the guys again. Um, because the one in the middle, okay, here we go. I'm adding this up. So Brad Allen um, he was the area manager. He's also gone on to be the National Boy Scouts chief liaison to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, that happened after this. So this is a pretty big, uh, pretty big deal. And then uh, he also ended up as it says chief executive officer of the Puget Sound Council. And so I had found a an article, I think it was the Seattle Times that uh, and this was like, you know, years after. So a, a journalist found out that he played a role in this huge cover up of this, you know, and he's like, now this guy is in charge of, uh, you know, of protecting our boys and, and like our whole state, basically. And this is kind of a huge problem, but it just seems like nothing ever really happens to these guys. And um, uh, with the Elias Lopez, I think he had the, I guess, the least amount to do. I the way uh, Adam portrays it is just he maybe he was new. This was kind of his new role. He just kind of passes it up 
the change. So it seems mostly Kim and Brad that were the ones really trying to do the cover up. But um, and I've got his name spelled wrong. I just realized and think so it's it's Elias with an S, um, not a Z. But he also stayed in Scouts and he is there now. Um, I see. Well, I'll, I'll put something on the screen and then Bill's got something, too, it looks like. So let's. Um, this is uh, his LinkedIn profile. So he's the district director at Boy Scouts of America in Idaho Falls. He is on the Teton Grand Council or, you know, Council of it's the same. It's the same place. Same thing. So, Bill, I don't know. Were you wanting it, to show the, I don't, the website? I don't want to put that up on the screen because it's got oh, phone okay. numbers on it. But if you oh, went yeah. to tetonscouts.org, which is the web page for that scout council, you can go to the About Us and you can look at the leadership of the council and you can see that uh, Mr. Lopez is the district director. It gives phone numbers and emails for that stuff, so I don't want to put that up on the screen. But um, his information shows currently that he is still in a leadership position in the scouts. And again, maybe to some degree, like you said, new and sort of innocent in this whole thing, but also there seems to be a lack of accountability through this entire process. Right. So I'm just trying to get to uh, the next issue. Here we go. I think we are ready. And I do have the name this, I have Vandersloot misspelled here as well. So I'm, I'm sorry for that, but I'll go ahead and get this up here. And, and then we became familiar of like, uh laws in Idaho that were just different than anywhere really that was saying that they, it just didn't make sense. It seemed like it served pedophiles and helped institutions because the laws were a five-year statute of limitations, criminally and civilly, and the reporting law was three years and it was like a, a minor offense if you didn't report. And, and you know, so here, you know, uh, in the state of Idaho at that time, uh, a man could serially sexually abuse violently children. And if the children didn't come forward within five years, they couldn't do a criminal case against the guy. And it was civil, it was the five-year statute too. And Idaho had a 50-year statute of limitations for rape. But for children, it was only five years. Hmm. And, and, and it was unbelievable. And I didn't even know what statute of limitations meant. My dad started talking to me saying, we got to, you know, our case was in the process, but he said, well, we got to change this. We got to change this. This this can't happen. So he went to uh, simultaneously while we were doing the scouting case, he went to change the statute of limitations in Idaho. And we had like death threats and we had emails against our family and, and the CS came to my dad and, and they said that his leader right over him. And I remember this, I, I, I he said to him, you can't talk to the news anymore. You can't talk to any of these places about this. You can't help with this process. If you do, you'll be fired from the CS. And my dad was like, hey, all of our life, we taught these kids how to stand up for truth and, and do this. And, and, and now that it's the most important time to do it, if you ask us to cl close, you know, not close our mouths and not, not talk, um, um, then, then I'm ready to resign. And that's how he lost his job. He says he resigned, but they put him in an ultimatum where he couldn't defend the children that were sexually abused, including tons of the, his seminary students. He had 10 in his classrooms at that point, 10 students that personally confided with him about being sexually abused at camp. Hmm. And, and, and uh, so uh, that happened. We changed the statute of limitations, millions and millions of dollars of lawsuits and criminal and civil started coming forward in the state of Idaho. It was the, I think Idaho is the second biggest Mormon state, the second biggest, you know, and the, you know, in the, in the work, something that came out really clear is this, you know, with this over this massive story that we didn't know. It was 2006 when Idaho governor Dirk Kemp Thorne signed the bill. Okay. That so eliminated a statute of limitations. Okay. And I was at that press conference. I spoke next to the governor with my then wife, more, okay. more when I, and we, we spoke to, you know, she, or I spoke at that as I signed that my brother signed that. And, and afterwards the, the scouting people then gave us the medal of merit, their most prestigious award. Um, yeah, okay. That was, that was, uh, for helping save, save kids after a settlement. 
thoughts on that? Especially the award at the end. Yeah, well, I'll go ahead and speak up. Yeah, this is what passes for leadership in the LDS church, right? You shut up, you stay in line, you join us in our concerted effort to cover up child sexual abuse within this Mormon uh, BSA council, or you lose your job. Yeah, it strikes me because you covered this a ton in the past RFM where you've gone after the Provo Police Department and their funny business uh, in terms of the church having power to manipulate the police department. And you went through the appeals process. And folks, if you're sort of new to this channel, I would suggest going to RadioFreeMormon.org and listening to all of Radio Free Mormon's work. But one of the things you did was you appealed the Provo Police Department's uh, hiding of whatever it was they were doing. Yeah, the refusal to give me unredacted copies of the police reports. And you can tell when the appeals group makes their decision. They had to side with them because it was attorney-client privilege. But you could tell by the comments they made that they were deeply disturbed by what they saw in the records that they could not release to the general public. You also have the thing we mentioned last week with Richard Lyman. Um, there's other issues that the Salt Lake Tribune's gone after the Provo Police Department as well. Mm -hmm. The church has a widespread problem of using its influence in unhealthy ways to protect itself from liability, to protect its business ventures or the facets of its company from liability. And that always seems to trump, it always seems to take a uh, priority and uh, preference over the healthiness and well-being and protection of victims. Yeah, they also right. have a history of using law enforcement to go after the members of the church who cross them. Yeah. Right. And I think that's a good thing to point out, Bill, because it's it's not just Mormons that have in, infiltrated like all of Boy Scouts. It, it's essentially the same as the church, but in Idaho, it's also all over in the legislature. And the details on this were pretty sparse in Adam's thing, but he did iterate how difficult it was and that there was intense, intense uh, opposition at first. And even from the community, I think. So it's it really is all levels down to the individual members who are also kind of joining this bandwagon on the side of the church to try to protect the the good name supposedly of the church and scouts and so um it just was like literally everywhere so i do actually before i forget i i want to put here someone was correcting me ab about the age that brad was in his 20s i think when, when this happened with adam so i it seems like i misspoke there about how much earlier his other victim was but there was a victim much earlier than Adam that Kim Hamilton also did help to cover. So thank you for that correction there. Um, I just didn't want to forget that there, but I did want to say, and this is something I would like to do a big research dive about, is the process of that change in legislation, because it's basically about a year ago now, it was, well, it was in August of last year that the AP news article came out. There was a, a rally at the Capitol um, that I participated in, and, um, and a movement was started called Mandate Clergy Reporting. There were four different bills introduced into the Utah State Legislature to try to um, get something like that on the books, and they all four failed, which was not a surprise, really. Um, just, you know, be, because this is the same environment here in Utah that the, the church really runs the show at the top and the church is going to be hurt most by something like this. So um, so I guess I wasn't surprised that nothing happened. But that was one thing really interesting to me about this interview was that at some point there was and it seems like almost single handedly. I and I know Adam would probably hate that I said that, but his his father and mother refused to give up. So even though there was so much in the community, there was so much at the, you know, in the legislation and the Boy Scouts and just just really the whole world against them. We really have a David and Goliath situation here. They were able, they didn't give up and they were able to actually cause this to happen. And I almost think that this opened up the church because at some point there's a switch. At some point the church is on board. And I feel like that happens a lot 
with almost anything in the church that they don't want to change doctrinally or that they're doing wrong, there's always this intense resistance until there's some kind of a tipping point where they realize that they have to, they really, they have to switch over sides. So then they do. And so I think that's kind of what happened. Like the law was changed that Adam and his brother, like they get the highest medals available, I guess, in scouts. Um, you know, it just, it's just amazing you know, that, that that can happen when, especially intensely, they were trying to cover up this. They were trying to, you know, it was, it, the, the prosecutors were Boy Scouts. They were trying to let this guy off without any jail time, you know, and then and then now, now that everybody, now that there's so much public attention, international attention on this, now they're patting them on the back for doing the right thing. Now, now they want to give them an award. And I just think, I, I, and, you know, with Hillam kind of being in the shadows in the background behind this with, with people not really knowing, I, I really think that must have just, you know, been really a, a, a stick up his ass that that happened and that this kid, you know, that disrupted so much was was getting a, a medal for that. But mm. anyway, yeah, yeah, there's there's just so much going on here. So I, I guess I shouldn't get into it too much. But I, I guess I did want to say this. The, that part of the show made me think that. I something can happen with the mandate clergy reporting. I know I've fallen into this trap of thinking like the church is just too big to topple. They have too much money, you know, um, they have too much power and influence. But I this was the lesson. I think another big one that I took from this is that there, there can be something done. So it's actually given me a lot more hope when it comes to child abuse stuff in the state of Utah. Um, and so I'm, I'm working on a project with, with Floodlit, hopefully for that. Uh, hopefully we can bring some more attention to the problem. And so that's just a real quick um, piece. And I, I hope this is something that our audience will continue to uh, fight for and not give up on. Um, you know, take an example from Adam and his family that, uh, that nothing is, uh, no one is too big. There, the church isn't too big of a Goliath to not fall. That's the whole point of the story is that a, a small person can win against a big one. So anyway, um, I wasn't planning on going on that rant, but but we can we can keep going to the next piece. Maven, can I say one thing about the good name of the church? <laughs> yeah. When you said that, uh, something came to me and I jotted it down. I get so sick and tired of hearing people talking about protecting the good name of the church. And here's what came to me. The good name of the church is an illusion that is kept up by sweeping all the ugly stuff under the rug. Yeah. Mormonism okay. says to avoid the appearance of evil. The problem is often Mormonism tries to give off the appearance of goodness. But underneath the white shirt, underneath all the the leader, you know, the handbooks and the, the disciplinary, there is a there's an institution that has no problem repeatedly over and over again thousands of times of doing the wrong thing and pretending it's good. I have said before, I'll say it again. The church talks about family, family, family. It's their big PR move, right? Family first, family, family, family. But each and every time when it comes down to a decision that a member has to make and they have to choose between the church and their family, and in this case, their children, you are always supposed to choose the church over your family. Always. It is a church first church, not a family first church. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to add this up here. Um, I just, um, I've got a quote in here from, um, and I've got the news source in here as well, but uh, does one of you actually want to read it? And I have, I have Hillam up. We don't know that for sure this uh, is referring to Hillam again because of the ambiguity around what top level leaders mean. Um, I did think it could mean him though. And uh, I just wanted to know if someone uh, could go ahead and read this quote uh, that happened. Um, this was a response to the legislature being changed. So does one of you two wanna? I'm, I'm happy to. The The okay. lawmakers unanimously voted to do away with the statue of statute of limitations on child molestation. And the governor signed the bill into law with the Steeds and Jeff Bird, another scout victim standing by, the House Committee Chairman wrote of the Grand Teton Council to ask why its leader had not been fired. So if if that was Hillam, 
Yeah, I just think it makes a lot of sense, especially with his continued um, presence in Adam's life, which we'll be getting into. So real quick at the bottom there, I have a, a clip that has uh, the word perversion files in it. Um, this was something that had ended up being released. I think it was a different Boy Scouting abuse scandal that, that basically, I think it was a, in Oregon, actually. Um, these these files were basically the the red flag files, and they were highly, highly, highly confidential. So the Boy Scouts, uh, the top leadership, did know about a lot of these abusers, and they kept records on them, not to actually protect the children or make sure they didn't like come back. Um, it, it's just anyway, that's what this file is called, and they are searchable online. We can also make that available in the comments. But uh, and this is something uh, I'll shout out Flood Lit again as well. Um, we've got two files. I'm putting them on the screen now, and they're pretty. They're pretty small. I did try to blow one of them up, but what these are are form letters that are sent when they when the Boy Scouts did, you know, tell someone to, uh, you know, basically not come back when there was an issue here. Um, yeah, this is a form letter, and then I don't know if one of you has it bigger on your screen than I do. I kind of have everything small. Um, I can see one the one on the left, but not the one on the right. So yeah, it's the same one. It's just a blow up of the kind of the full thing. So yeah, if you want to go ahead and read that. So this is a letter that's written to a person named Kevin, K-E-V-E-N. I've never seen it spelled that way before. It's signed by Harold G. Hillam, by the way, who is Bonnie Corden's dad, in case anybody out there doesn't know that. Bonnie Corden's dad, Harold Hillam, and the council president, and Scott Johnson, the scout executive. Okay, so here, dear Kevin. After careful review, we have decided that your registration with the Boy Scouts of America should be suspended. We are therefore compelled to request that you sever any relations that you may have with the Boy Scouts of America. A refund of your registration fee is attached. You should understand that BSA... Did you want to say something, Maven? I just... When there's so much wrong that they do towards the kids, I they make sure that an abuser it, gets his registration fee back. It just, I don't know what to say. Oh, this is to an abuser. This is an abuser. Yes, this is. I think it's Kevin B. Marsh or you know something. It, it, it's there. But yeah, these are. Kevin this is Nelson, this is ahead. a form letter, and it isn't like you. We are releasing you. We're cutting you off. Don't ever come back or anything like that. I mean, did you catch that when you were reading that? Um, we're requesting, right? We're requesting, we're, we are compelled, but then request. So like that's, you know, it just, that seems kind of conflicting there, but request that you sever any relations that you may have with the Boy Scouts of America. Isn't that interesting? It seems very polite language. Yeah. They're asking this abuser to please, please don't come back, I guess. But it's just, yeah, they're, they're putting, I guess, the onus on them. We're requesting that you stop coming here. We're not mm -hmm. telling you never show up again, right? Anyway, right. That, that's a minor thing. Um, I, we can move on. Actually, I don't even know if we, we need to really see the rest of it. But this was something that didn't necessarily stop an abuser. And this was also in the Scouts of Honor documentary. A lot of times they would just move to a different troop. And, um, and you know, often that was... That was it. So there was one more. Um, so it's more of the same thing. Um, so this is another screen. It's it's like I said, it's a form letter, but we still we've got Hillam's signature on it. So we know at the very very least, we know that these things were were getting up to him. So when we get into stuff in the you know later, we we know that he knows. I guess that's that's all that I really like really want to establish here. So um, I get the dear Mr. Murray. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I get the dear Mr. Murray on the second letter, but the first letter seems unusually. Mm -hmm informal dear I, kevin i don't know i mean yeah. do they know this guy it's dear almost kevin. like he knows him huh yeah I, I think one thing that should be said too is if if you're an abuser uh, and again i don't mean to make a joke but i think it gets the point across louis ck in a stand-up special is talking about sex abuse child abuse and he says something like he goes he goes i'm not saying i'm not saying that all leaders in the scouts are child molesters. I'm not saying that. What I might be saying is that the best ones are. And the point he's making 
is that if you are a abuser of children, if, if in your brain you have the desire to inappropriately touch children sexually and abuse them, you are going to look for places that will be safe for you to take advantage of that inclination you have. And there are really great places on this planet to do that. Uh, if you're in a male leadership role in Mormonism, it's a great place because you're allowed one-on-one -on -one access with children. So if you can look the part of a good Mormon and you can work your way up into a lay leadership, which isn't hard. I served as a bishop, damn it. So you can easily get into leadership if you're in a ward, elders quorum president, young men's presidency, whatever. You'll have opportunities, even in callings that don't do with the youth, you'll have chances to be alone with the youth. Boy Scouts is the same. It doesn't take much. You have this too deep leadership, but man, some of this stuff is so hit or miss. And then when things happen, I was reading up today, Maven, on this story. And this person was constantly finding themselves alone with the boys. And he was constantly being told by the leaders to knock it off. But they kept him there and he keeps having the next chance to do the same thing. Abusers will find ways to put themselves in spaces that are safe for abusers. And the Boy Scouts has had a significant problem with that. And Mormonism has had a significant problem with that. Oh, yes, absolutely. And it's only common sense. I mean, and I don't mean to make light of it either, but this reminds me of a famous quote from Willie Sutton, the somewhat famous, at least at the time, bank robber back in the 1930s who was asked some who was asked, why do you rob banks? Because it's so dangerous, right? Why do you rob banks? And his response was, because that's where the money is. Yeah, right. And if you're gonna if you're gonna molest kids, you're gonna go where kids are. Yeah. I think this it's was something hilarious. Adam pointed out was that if um, you know, if if uh, this guy had been caught like in a school or something, and it had gone up that way, that they they could be facing decades in prison. But for the same thing, and especially like with this guy, um, yeah, be able to to violently abuse many children over and over and over again, and and not ever be even turned into the police. And then when he finally is, they try to get him off without any jail time. It's just really astounding. But we we can move on. You guys, you guys are in here for the long haul. I really tried hard to try to keep this within normal Mormonism live time frame. But let's. And I think that is where most of the details are, but let's, let's go ahead and get into the marriage and therapy. So this is where there is now a, a, a connection with Jody Hildebrandt. So um, let's see, I might need to get the next thing up here. Here we go. This is going more into the connection. I think he had already called him. As an area authority? Before, yeah, because I, early in our dating, we went to temples or when he came over to be uh, at the conference where he came over to become an Area 70, I I saw her parents for the first time. Okay. And and so, and we hadn't been dating very long. So he became an Area Authority while you were dating her. Yes. And, okay. And the His thing daughter. was then, you know, we went to this real rocky engagement was just tons of trauma with her family trying to end the 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 engagement. And then finally they agreed, and we come over and seen them in, in Holland several times and tried to be real peaceful and everything. And so we, we, we get, uh, to the temple day where her whole family and, and her dad and her mom and everyone were there. And, the, you know, we we're just getting ready in the, in the temple cellar at the Idaho Falls temple, Elder Groberg was 45 minutes late and we didn't know why. And then we got married and it, there was a bunch of stuff going on. My wife then was super upset. I don't know everything that her parents were telling her. Um, it was a really rock, rocky beginning. Um, later, after all this stuff came out years later, the secretary to Elder Groberg had been in our family stake. She contacted my dad and she said, I, I have to tell you guys the truth about this. Uh, that day that your son was going to get married, uh, Elder Helam called Elder Groberg and President Groberg of the Idaho Falls Temple and spent 45 minutes while he was supposed to be going to the wedding trying to convince them to call the wedding off and not let it happen in the temple. And he said that he was telling him that this was this terrible kid at scouting that, that had lied about all these abusers and all this money and everything. And, and finally, Elder Groberg said, this is, this is my temple and my calling. 
after they got into a heated argument, this lady overheard, she said it was like a heated argument inside the temple in the office. And finally, he said, this is my authority under my jurisdiction, and these people will get married, and he hung up the phone. Good for Elder Groberg. Yes, props. We've got one leader that actually does the right thing. I, I believe that's the only one I remember in this whole entire mess of a, a story. So I, I'm putting back up on the screen the the slides with the two names with Harold Hillam on there. Um, and then Chris Kleiwig, who was, I, I think they were from Holland. I think that was, I, I'm, I might be, now I might be embarrassed if I'm getting uh, the wrong country, but he's, he's in Europe and uh, it's his daughter that Adam meets at BYU and they, they get engaged. So, so Hillam not only disrupts the engagement, but tries again the day of to uh, try and stop this. This is how upset he is the day of at the time of the wedding, the wedding's supposed to start. And as you know, as, as good as, um, Elder Groberg was for shutting it down. Like he still like tied him up for 45 minutes when he was supposed to be, uh, you know, performing this marriage. So it's just, it's just pretty crazy. Anyway, um, we can go on to the next one or do you guys have any, uh, any comments there? No, it's just okay. amazing. Let's talk about an abuse of authority. I think section 121 has something to say about that. I think so too. And I think I might be actually, let's see, I'm worried I might be missing the wrong slide here. Sorry. Once but maybe guys. I should say the obvious here. It's not just that Harold Hillam apparently was involved in trying to shut this whole thing up when it was going on, but when he wasn't successful at doing that, now he's going to castigate and try and interrupt the marriage, mainly because I suppose it's because it's, it's of a friend's daughter, right? But still, regardless, He's going to call the temple and try and get this wedding in the temple called off on the day of the wedding while the husband and wife, Adam and his wife, are there ready to get married and everybody else is there to get married. This is wrong, wrong, wrong in so many ways. If he'd been successful, can you imagine the the shame of something like that, of having a general authority call to interrupt your temple marriage, saying that you are unworthy? Everyone would know. Everyone would know because they were all already there. It's just, it's amazing. It's. Yeah. Anyway. I don't want to say anything negative about Harold Hillam, but at a minimum, I think he's a person who doesn't have a problem with abusing his authority. Yeah, but yeah. doesn't Mormonism teach us that? I mean, how many times in your your time in the church did you sense like the right thing to do, but leader, but the leader says like, I preside, I have authority. We do this my way. And again, having served as a bishop, served as a counselor and a bishopric, I ran into that at least a dozen times where someone's trying to do the right thing. And the question isn't about what is the right thing. The question is about who is highest up in leadership. And that person gets to say, there's not even, <clears throat> there's not even a safe space to talk about what's right or wrong. You are told that you don't, you're not high enough up the ladder. Somebody else is. So, you know, when <clears throat> when Bruce R. McConkie wrote Eugene England and said, it's your job to reiterate what I say or to be silent. That's Mormonism. That's that's whether you're a good leader or an unhealthy human being in LDS leadership, we all know that that's the code book. That's how we work. Whoever's the highest up gets to make the decisions. And hopefully they're listening and doing things in healthy ways. But if they're not, so be it. Well, doing the right thing in Mormonism means doing what your priesthood leader tells you to do. Right. Right. Okay, I've got another clip. So this is going to introduce um, how he gets involved with Lifestar and Jody Hildebrandt. And then I also included kind of a bit, because I feel like this plays a role as well. It's not just Mormon leadership that's a, a huge failure. Uh, throughout this, it's also Mormon doctrine. And so for this one, I, I kept a lot of clips to kind of highlight the church's view on masturbation, because that's how Adam kind of gets dragged into therapy with Jody, you know, for a really normal thing. But of course, it gets, you know, um, pathologized into something really, uh, really evil and terrible. So but by the I'm way, before you play that, that, before you play yeah. that, the number one soundbite that shows 
that authority rules no matter what. It's wrong to criticize leaders of the church, even if the criticism is true. Elder Oaks telling us that even if you're right about a leader doing a shitty thing, keep quiet. Don't talk about it. It's so ass backwards. Right. And what did your state president say to you, Bill, at your excommunication hearing? It After you proved to him that Elder yeah. Holland was saying things that were not true. Uh, he said, you cannot criticize uh, the leaders of the church. And I said, even if they lie. And he said, even if they lie. Yep. Yeah. All right. I'll put this up. He's a 70, by the way, now. That leader, that stake president so you, is, you, you a, is a 70. Settlement. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. Right. We're good. Okay. I desperately just want to get back to my normal life. And, and I remember I was in school in the fall and, and I just, I did this report near the end of fall and I started missing finals and stuff because there was a lot of trauma around sharing all the abuse that happened in this extensive way with the, you know, I think it was 50 pages long and, and very professional people that knew how to handle this. It's, this is your ward bishop? It's our ward bishop at Wy Mount Terrace. Oh, it's a married ward. Yeah. Okay. I said to him, hey, we need we should probably get some counseling. We want really good counseling. Um, he got back with me after doing something on it. And he said that his, uh, he felt that we should go to this group called Lifestar and that it would be great marriage counseling. And we later learned that his brother owned Lifestar. Oh. And Jody worked for him. So we get into this therapy group. Jody's really charismatic. My wife starts just loving it. I'm excited she's getting help and and some of the personal issues that she had struggled with. And and I didn't originally mind the strictness with the group because I thought that, you know, it was therapeutic to, you know, there was a lot of guilt and shame behind masturbation and pornography in the Mormon church. I mean, um, I had a lot of guilt and shame. I mean, as a kid growing up, I had discovered masturbation a few weeks before I met Brad Stoll. And then I always believed that, that God sent this pedophile into my life to punish me because I was a sick person. And I, I just wanted to pause there on that. That was an wow. incredibly sad part of the show. And he reiterated it another time, but I can only imagine that he's not the only one to ever have thought that. So not only is it really terrible that he's, again, because of this teaching around masturbation, that it's a sin, that it's so evil, this is yet another way that he's kind of traumatized by this abuse is, is by seeing it potentially as a punishment from God. But it, it goes even further when, because of this therapy, they kind of like put him in the same group. So that's, um, that's the rest of the clip. I'll go ahead and put it back up on the screen. Um, this way. Okay. And I think, and in all honesty, uh, I had looked at probably about two hours of pornography collectively in my entire life. Up to that point. Up to that point, yeah. It got a lot worse the last two or three weeks of my life starts with Jody. Um, some of the things she said right in the beginning was like, that she, it kind, kind of like from my perspective, we as a member of a Mormon a church and Mormon church and everybody in this group was Mormons. And, you know, there's just this feeling that you always want to be temple worthy. And as a guy, sometimes that was hard to do uh, when the internet came out or if you ever looked at an indecent picture or anything and you had to repent to your bishop. And, and you know, you've gone back and forth thinking, oh, I, I, this, this is the last time I'll never do this again. And it's sometime you mess up again and you call, call bishop and, you know, you're sitting there thinking this lady's promising that if we go into her program and do her stuff, we'll never have problems again. Yeah. And and I one of the things I want to make sure the world knows and reporters know is that in the Mormon church, sexual sin is is next to what in it's, terms it's of next severity? to murder. Right. You know, you're a kid and you're at Sunday school and they're they're reading scriptures and it's like if you look at a woman and lust after her, that's that's committing adultery in your heart. 
And then another scripture, it's like committing adultery is the next thing to murder. And you do the spiritual geometry in your head and you're just like, oh, you know, and then people at church are telling you, well, what, what is pornography? And then they're like, well, if it turns you on, it's pornography. You're your kid. You're not allowed to masturbate. So practically you have no sexual outlet at all as you develop as a teenager. So, so you get into this hyper hypersexual state where anything you see, you know, you're like, oh, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I was repenting to my bishop for uh, underwear ads and in, in, in the Sunday newspaper that, that was too much for me to look at. I mean, that that's the just for seeing them. just for seeing them. It's like, oh, I had terrible thoughts. I'm sorry. And, and just feeling so bad that I was like committing murder. She's having us talk about how they're sexually acting out. This other guy in the group starts explaining that he's a voyeurist and he's got victims. And I didn't know what a voyeurist was. And then this other guy started explaining how he was an exhibitionist and he had victims. And I didn't know what an exhibitionist was. And there was another guy that talked about incest, that he had problems with incest. I did know what that was. I felt horrified. So I went home and I told my wife, I said, I, I, first of all, I went and I looked it up. And then I found out what, the voyeurism, what voyeurism was and, and what exhibitionism was. And then I realized I was, I was in a group with three sexual predators and me. And, I, and because I was a victim of sexual abuse, I did not feel comfortable. You know, it says, imagine if you put Elizabeth Smart in a room full of sexual predators for her therapy. And, and, and worse, said that she was one of them. And, and I, I didn't feel comfortable at all. These people are sexual predators. There are people whose lives they've messed up. And I am not supposed to be in here. I am a victim of child abuse, a survivor. And I can't deal with this trauma of being around these people. I am out of here. That, that was my first red, red flag. I, I, I was done. And, and my wife got desperate in this discussion, called Jody. Jody called her in. She comes back to me and said that that was my sexual addiction. I got both Jody was telling me and and my wife was telling me that that was my sexual addiction telling me that I was a victim of sexual abuse and that I that because of that I was in denial and and it just started escalating from there like, like I tried to get out of that group and they were they were like you are the sexual addict you aren't healthy enough um one of the things that unhealthy religious groups do is to convince you that you need it. You need the group. You need the, you need to be on this team. And in, in some way they convince you that you're broken, right? You know, two, he said his whole life, he'd watch two hours of pornography. And I say like, I did that probably on Monday, you know, like, like this idea that you you're constantly in Mormonism told that you're broken masturbation, which again, is normal and everybody's doing it. Um, they convince you that you're some sort of sinner and they write about it in their manuals and they tell you in the talks and man, I, I was a convert. I used drugs. I sold drugs. I had friends that swore. I had friends that had sex. I, I somehow didn't take Mormonism ultra seriously on the things I knew it was wrong about. But if I had been born into the system, I can see why someone would believe it, like believe all of it so seriously that they really do believe they're broken. They really do believe that they're not good enough. And, you know, he said at the scout camp that he thought God had sent this predator because of how bad he was. And he's only bad because that's the messaging he's given his entire life. And that's what Mormonism does to you. I know I've seen I've seen a lot of Mormon stories episodes and it, and people have also talked about this in deconstructing groups like the um, ex Mormon subreddit. I I was aware of how many young boys because of these teachings did think of themselves as predators or that they had the potential to be I mean both straight young men but also especially those that that knew that they were they were gay because because it's even worse then you know i i've seen so many men especially have this fear as as a child that they're this evil predator that they would hurt kids 
if they can't get this thing about themselves under control. But I never thought about it from, you know, on top of all of that, someone having been a victim of abuse themselves on top of all of it. It's just horrific. So I, I thought it was an important point to include, you know, about it. And then we're going to go into the next part. This part is going to go more into how the marriage was kind of systematically destroyed. And um, there was someone that put up a comment. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and show it. And I forgot to, I should have maybe made space to address this, but I do want to address Jody a little bit. So this is the comment. It says, did you see the Mormon stories episode with Jody's niece? Um, they said that Jody has an, a, a vendetta against men. And I think, I think that's true. It does seem from what evidence I can see that um, that Jody is a like a misandrist in the true sense of the word. And I think for for men that really hate women um, and think that they have all of these advantages, that they're manipulative and things like that, like Jody is that woman that these men fear every woman is or could be if they had the chance. And so I just um I want to be upfront and, and honest about where she's, I don't want to downplay that because it does seem like she has a very big problem with men. And then there was a lot of people that have, have speculated about her sexuality and that, you know, if, if she's a closeted lesbian and all of these kinds of things are, are kind of at play here in, in the way she, but I say regardless, her sexual orientation either way has nothing to do with the Miss Andre. Right. So I, and then that's kind of another trope too, that I'm, I was battling in the comments was this idea that if, if a woman is a lesbian, that she hates men or that she would be this awful to them. So I just want to point that out, that that's not true. That's a really, uh, a woman can be a man hater of any sexual orientation and that that's, you know, that's not what's at play here. We just have a very deeply disturbed individual. Um, and I did actually want to also bring up with the, with Jesse's interview, really pointing out how manipulative this woman was. And the thing that stood out to me the most about that was that um, one of Jody's, I think actually all, all of Jody's children already have cut off contact with her. But um, I guess one of her daughters, I guess, so this is like third hand, so I apologize for that. But this this was in that interview that the daughter of Jody said she she could not talk to her mother. It was, it was complete no contact because she says, as like, as much as I know how manipulative and and evil this woman is, I, I she feared that if she did let her mother back into her life, that she would still not be able to resist or fall under the power of the manipulation that this woman has. She said, I think the the phrase was that if my mom told me that the sky was yellow, I would believe her. And this is someone who's cut off contact with her, knowing how harmful she is, like still not thinking they have what it takes to withstand that. So it just does seem like she really has a pathological ability to manipulate people. So that's the preface. Uh, we can go ahead and go into the next clip. Let me go ahead and get it back up on the screen. Here we go. Okay. And then things start to take a really dark turn. How so? Jody taught that all these people in support of us, they were all codependent relationships and it was toxic and she would just spin it all into this language until she'd have everybody just chopping all the arms of support off in your life till there was no one else to support you except for Jody Hildebrand. There were all these boundaries that you had to draw. She coached people to get them so that they, they wouldn't be near anybody. And she just always taught the relationship needed to die before it could be reborn. And very shortly, we I learned that if it didn't die on its own, Jody Hildebrandt would kill the relationship so that it could be reborn. Meaning your marriage. She would destroy it in any sociopathic way alive. And, and if you look in these records that I've got, I've got written documents of her in action doing this. She says she has to help more when identify how she's a victim, that, that having accepting that a, that a husband had looked at porn and masturbation, how, how more, more when didn't know how terrible that was and, and that she had to help her understand that that's wrong and, and that she had to help more when understand why, how dangerous I was and how I was the most dangerous person she had ever met. And see, we subpoenaed Jody Hildebrandt's uh, medical records of me. 
and they were like half of a page long and they said nothing. And so by this point, your wife has, has abandoned you, has deserted yeah, you? Yeah, she disappeared with our baby, you know? It was so weird. She came up to me and she's like, I love you. You're such a good guy. We're going to work things out. She said that to me and I thought, oh, wow. And I just went to school, was working on my computer and then I noticed nobody was there and, you know, throughout the day. And then I just, everyone was, I couldn't get a hold of her. I couldn't find her. So this is after your second baby was born or first? Yeah, it was three weeks after our second baby was born. And my, my wife with this crazy therapist is gone with our one-year-old and our three-week-old baby. This is absolutely therapist malpractice. The fact that the therapist is, is pushing your vulnerable pregnant or newly yeah. have, having had a child wife yeah. to be cutting you off in every single possible way as a spouse in a legal married relationship and, and basically intentionally driving a wedge between you using her ther therapeutic influence and the power differential uh, yeah. as a therapist over a client. So not only is Jody ruining your marriage, she's priming her, your wife to start gathering evidence on you, to start viewing you as a sexual predator, and to start gathering evidence that then can be used in an eventual divorce and legal proceedings. I mean, it's just very clear she's she's priming your wife to turn you into a, a felon, a convict, through false accusations. Um, I don't know. You know, it, you could theorize that maybe Elder Helam planned to send me to Jody, but yeah, I, I think as the story develops, we'll understand that um, Elder Helam became, a, a, well, anyway, the, the, he facilitated Jody in an extensive way. You know, yeah. And it's a lot of it's just circumstantial. We'll just keep telling everything that we saw. Yeah. Because these people are so secret, but, but we'll tell it and let people think. Yeah. So I, I left that part in there just, just to kind of cover bases. Cause yeah, a lot of this stuff is speculative. Um, but it kind of ties into what I, I pointed out earlier, the top levels of the church are really good at being able to kind of hide behind a screen and, and not always have their deeds known. Um, so and there were a lot of skips in there. So if there was anything, maybe too much of a gap missing for people, I think there's enough to really get what's going on. But the full details and the, and the level that it went to is, is in that. I did want to bring up um, a comment. Um, this was about what I had said about Jody and the manipulation. So the comment says, it's less about her ability to manipulate. She has built trust over time with so many male Mormon authorities and a Mormon patient will trust that beyond, re uh, um, beyond reality. And that is something that Adam talks about. She often bragged about, and uh, whether or not it's true, that's still to be determined. I've seen some people like struggle to try to find, but of course we do know uh, even more lately that mm -hmm. uh, when the church doesn't want to have an association with somebody problematic, uh, they will start <laughs> deleting things. Um, so it's possible that Jody Hildebrandt is, you know, got the same treatment as Tim Ballard is now getting with uh, things just kind of rapidly disappearing down the memory hole. But I do want to say, so that part is true, but I, I want to go back to the manipulation um, because the, you know, the comment said it's, it's not so much about her ability to manipulate it. And I think it absolutely is. So it's both true. She, she had a lot of influence with, um, higher level authorities. And that is something that came into play for how much she was trusted by Mormon members of the church, but she also is very manipulative. And that was something else that I, I ended up cutting out of these clips, but Adam talks about the kind of mind games she would play and how, um, just how she acted in group therapy that really just got everybody gaslighting each other and everybody questioning themselves and their reality and just really basically being torn down mentally and getting to a place of just complete vulnerability and trust in Jody that she knows everything, even what's going on in their minds more than they do. So, um, yeah, so I just, she is an incredibly gifted manipulator. And, uh, and I, I just don't want that to really be downplayed, even for a lot of women that were in her life. Did I'm, I'm not excusing Adam's wife here, but, um, I just, I guess I, I can see that, you know, Jody's an incredibly powerful push. I'll, I'll just say that. So, um, any, any comments from you guys? No, not here. Okay. 
All right. So now we're getting into the third kind of section, which is where BYU comes in, um, which Bill alluded to earlier. RFM has a history of trying to get records from BYU. And and that's something that he's got in, co in common with Adam Steed. So we've got BYU police involved in this. Um, BYU Honor Code Office, they're, they're kind of the main baddies in this. But even the counseling center, um, I think maybe actually now I'm not so sure. So maybe I'll, I'll take that back because normally uh, from what I understand for BYU being what we know it to be, the counseling center is kind of an oasis in a, a place like that. So, so I've heard actually very good things about the counseling center. And I, and so I guess I, I won't say any more because I can't remember specifically if they did have a role or if it did really maybe all come through the honor code office. And maybe it was the honor code office that kind of overshadowed what the counseling center was trying to do with Adam. So I'm not clear on that. But anyway, we can uh, let me get this next one ready here and get this up. Here we go. So when when Jody and Morwenna and I assume Elda Helam weaponized the honor code office, uh, I don't think the honor code office guys ever knew that I would subpoena their records. And in some ways, Ed Morin was a moron <laughs> because he sat there and talked openly about everything they were doing. So these files are incredibly incriminating. So this is Edward Moran, signed March 13th, 2009. Yeah. On March 11th, 2009, Jody Hildebrandt returned the phone call and was interviewed via phone by Edward L. Morin, M-O-R-I-N. Uh, Jody's number is Blake. Jody was advised that Morwenna had signed a waiver allowing BYU and Jody to exchange confidential information. Um, Jody was aware that Adam had not signed a waiver. Jody noted that she decided to call the honor code office back once Morwenna was in her office so that Morwenna could hear everything that was said between Jody and BYU. Jody provided the following information. The text in bold reflects the information provided by Morwenna during the interview with Jody. So Jody is literally calling BYU trying to get you in trouble, trying to get you expelled. Jody warned that anyone who crosses Adam will be attacked in some fashion and added that Adam is a predator and a threat that BYU needs to be aware of. She repeatedly referred to Adam as pathological. So that's what your former therapist violating Jody Hildebrandt, Jody Hildebrandt violating client patient confidentiality tells your BYU honor code office in an attempt to smear you and get you kicked out of BYU. It wasn't that she just used them. It's that she used them as a weapon to destroy everything in my life. And she was sitting in the courtroom next to Elda Helam as these protective orders came out and the allegations about child abuse came out. I told them I didn't want to do it, but if she didn't bring the kids back, that I, I, I had a school, I had a class with a, a lady that was a professor and, and she told me about it, PKP, I, I forget the abbreviation, but it was this kidnapping thing that if people kidnap your children, you can file it. And I said, I, I just said, please, let's just talk. I don't want to do this. But at some point, this is going to come up. So that was my threatening lawsuits against her family. Yeah. But lot lawsuits. Yeah, right. All of a sudden, it's multiple, right? Well, and lawsuits being the guy that sued scouting. Right. You know, it's, it's sending this language that you need to protect the BYU institution from somebody that does lawsuits. Mm, yeah. I have a five hundred pages honor code file in my name that I subpoenaed from Brigham Young University, where those people worked in every way to to, sh to stop anyone from going with me with my kids, because I had to have someone 21 years old or older. There were five different people that they went after in crazy ways. Um, I was at I was at BYU, and the police came, the BYU police man came and put me in a room. It was, it's a, and, and he sat me down and he asked me in depth about the child abuse that happened to me as a kid for like two hours, two or three hours we were in there. And then after that, 
he asked me if I had child abuse or child child pornography on my computer. And and I and I told him absolutely not. And and then he left. And I just remember walking out of there wondering what the fuck just happened that to me. That was BYU police, right? Yeah. Yeah, what what just happened to me? Yeah. Yeah, in my opinion, he dropped the F bomb a little bit late. I would have been using it to the cop. But they had done when when he said that there were there were five people that the honor code office also went after it and they were literally just for being another adult when when he wanted to have time with his kids he he had to have supervised visits because of these accusations that were made so he just needed an adult with him 21 years or over and and anyone that he would ask to do that they went after them so so one of them had also been a, a victim of, of child abuse and he suspects that this was known probably through the church avenue through ecclesiastical information um and um and re-traumatized her by d basically doing the same thing and then also accusing her of having an uh, affair with him and that they threatened to put her on probation and kick her out um and then there were others that they made really really wild accusations about um and so uh, just real quick one of them uh, was a it was a man from i think it was I iran and uh just had a picture of him giving a cousin a kiss on the cheek because men kissing men in, in like a familiar way a familial way is really normal over there but but they they took this to make accusations of him being a homosexual and then also because he he was a cook and he used wine in his cooking occasionally then they also tried to make like turn that into an alcoholic problem like they just really went above and beyond to just try to cut off anybody so th this is why it, like it's just so insidious because it's not just like I, it, it might have been one thing if if jody had reached out and you know told the information that she did that she obviously shouldn't have and they thought well you know maybe we should be more careful or maybe we won't help out with this thing or that thing but it's just so extra to target these other individuals like that for nothing else other than that they're with him and then i just wanted to point out again hillam being here showing up in court next to jody mm -hmm. i so i just think that was something especially the lawsuits thing he brought up was something they i assume they talked extensively about and that it wasn't that jody just knew in passing you know that he had sued the scouts and won but i i think this was an issue anyway any any other thoughts from you guys i'm i'm astonished and i keep thinking of this thought that keeps running through my head which is byu is what america would look like if the mormon church were in charge of the government mm. I think so. And another thought I kept having was like, boy, this is a terrible thing that happened to this man. Surely it can't get any worse, right? But it yes. does. And then, over and, and and then over you're again, like, man, that well, that's thought. the worst. Yes. Yeah. But, and then it gets worse again. And so if you're there right now and you're thinking it can't get any worse, it can. And then we'll go ahead and play that next. I guess it can and it does. So, um, yeah, so here we've got also like um, now like local leadership and um, I guess entrapment setting that up here. I don't hear it, maybe. Me and Elder or Elder uh, Bishop Olson, and he he says to me, "Sorry, I'm going to pause and I didn't realize I had muted it, so I'll just play it again from the beginning here." So, during that time. Uh, my bishop calls in, calls me an elder, or elder uh, Bishop Olson, and he he says to me, "I just met with her, your wife Morwenna. She still loves you. She totally thinks we can work this stuff out. Um, you need to really work to let her know that you care about her still, and that you love, and you you know that we can fix this thing." I I remember crying when I left. Thought, oh, maybe this will get fixed still, and 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 I asked him. I said, "Are you sure it's okay?" Because the protective order says you're the ecclesiastical leader. We can contact each other. He said, go to the police station, give her these things. He called her. She said it was okay. I go to the police station with these items. I give them to her. I first asked her, is it okay if we, if I give these to her and we talk? And, and she said, yeah, it's okay. I talked to the bishop. Everything's fine. And she just smiled. And I really felt that she was telling the truth. I gave her those things. And I smiled. And I was really nice to her. And... Then out of nowhere, she just turns and accused me that I was a homosexual. 
just randomly. I'm just shocked because that was a huge trigger for me in my psych evaluation report that she'd been reading and that Jody had been reading and that they'd been sharing with everyone. And four, three or four days later, when I went to pick up the kids for something, I got subpoenaed like a half inch page of papers. And those papers said that I had four felony charges against me. And I had absolutely no criminal record whatsoever. And, and so I had four felonies and it said 20 years in prison that I could, I could get. And I was terrified when I read this. And I, I, you know, I went, uh, I went to the bishop and the bishop said that, um, the bishop said that, uh, that he would absolutely testify and he was shocked and acted like it was just so crazy. And I remember going to my stake president on a Sunday, I was so worried and I went into his office and I had these files of Jody Hildebrandt's files like this big in my hand. And I, I said, I said, uh, you got, you got to see, you got to help my family. You got to see these files. And, and he turned to me and he goes, a woman doesn't just run away from her husband unless there's something. And I, and I looked at him and I was just shocked. And I, I said, what are you talking about? And he just looked at me and I said, are you talking about like physical violence or sexual abuse? And he goes, aha, just the fact that you said that makes me know that you're guilty of those things. And, and I said, look, you've got to look at these files. This is a, this is a cult. You've got to read these. You will see what I'm talking about. I had this huge thing of files and he looked at me and he said, he, he said, that's your addiction talking. Mm. And when he said that, I knew Jody had got to him. And I, it was my stake president. I just remember like I could hardly breathe. That I trusted and believed in this person. And I said, you, I begged him, please, please look at these files. And, and, and he said he, he re absolutely refused to. And then um, I told him, well, next time you get up at state conference and you testify that you get on your hands and your knees and you cry for every family out here, you remember that when we needed the help the most, you wouldn't even look, you wouldn't even help. And then he yelled at me to get out of his office. He goes, get out, just get out. And I, and I left. And my bishop calls me in right after that. And they removed my temple recommend. And he said, I, I said, why? And he goes, you called the state president names. I said, I didn't call him names. And I told him exactly what happened. And he, my bishop said, well, I don't agree with him, but I have to take your temple recommend. So they took my temple recommend away. And my bishop called me in and he said, I can't go to court to testify for you. The, ch the church legal team called and they said that they won't allow me to go to court. He said, I disagree with it. I know you were doing what I said, but I can't. So I got hung. Now I had criminal charges against me, four felonies. I, I'm, I'm in school at BYU and I'm late for, I remember I had finals and I'm late for one of the criminal court hearings by like 30 minutes. And I, I get there and um, uh, they arrested me and they, they put me in chains and they said that because it was felonies, I, I couldn't get off on bail. And they arrested me. And then they said that the judge went on vacation. So I was in jail. Somewhere between a week and two weeks, you're in jail. Yeah. So I got I, I, I got out of jail. And as soon as I got out of jail, I got a letter from BYU, uh, from Steve Baker, saying that I was kicked out of the university. So, yeah, when I, I said it can and will get worse, if, if you thought that it was just going to be like, the next step, I, I feel like there were seven things in there that just got worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, so I wanted to comment on uh, the the entrapment because this is something also that's ex shared and, and ex explained in a lot more explicit detail in Adam's interview. And this is this wasn't even the worst case of entrapment. Um, so I, I those those ones I left for the interview, but this was something you know in divorce, there could be all kinds of misinterpretations and, and feelings, you know, it's just, it's a, it's an intense time. So I think misunderstandings can legitimately happen and, and be blown out of proportion. That's not what's happening here. This isn't just a misunderstanding Jody coached women to do this. So I think the Bishop, at least initially was innocent in talking with, 
um, the wife and saying, yeah, everything's fine. And, you know, it, she also wanted to get some things from Adam, including a journal. I think I might have cut that out of the clip. And so I think there was multiple reasons why she was playing nice here. I think one was for the the entrapment that 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 was the end result of what they were hoping for two was probably to get that journal back that would be really incriminating against her so there was a benefit to her for that and then three was the part where he says that she accuses him of being a homosexual because she i think that was a deliberate because of the psych evaluation he said that was in there as a as w one of his triggers about this abuse and, and and also because of how the community treated him after all of this came out, um, that being called a homosexual is one of the things that's just really horrific for him. And it just seems like she just threw that out there on purpose to see what he would do. And um, and I think she also used that. I think she, like his and his reaction as like uh, something else to kind of blow out of proportion to make him seem like a, a an unstable dangerous man so the, there's just really a lot going at play here a lot of layers and a lot of just deliberate it's just sad it's just really sad what happened so and then rfm i saw you reacting you know when he was asking the bishop if it's okay to meet because of the protective order i i saw your face on that and i'm sure that's something you've seen before so yeah memo to all anyway. listeners for the future if you're ever going to violate a protection order don't do it in the parking lot of a police station and you you would think too that like i don't know I, that was another thing that seemed kind of strange about the whole thing but um yeah so i think we're maybe the next clip or if we're ready for that let me see but if once i can again, get that up any shows, other comments this, yeah this shows how the bishop inserting himself into this position where he has no business being all right he made adam feel okay about violating a no contact order and the bishop has no ability to modify a no contact or, order only a judge does and this bishop was way out of bounds with what he did it's a lack of training i'm sure I'm pretty sure it's a lack of training. So he goes in there, he uh, encourages and uh, ends up getting Adam to violate a no contact order by going and meeting with his wife and he gets arrested. By the way, and the then bishop, he doesn't do the right thing when when the entrapment happens. I believe the bishop was shocked. I, I believe the bishop was also a pawn in this thing, basically allure um, that that Adam would obviously trust, but. The fact that church legal got to him and he wouldn't testify just really sunk things for Adam because then I think that it just it's just his word against her word, right? What? And then does it, he not have an attorney? Does, order. does Adam not have a lawyer? Because no, he, if I'm a lawyer, does. I would say to the bishop, "Look, I will I will help you out here. I'll take the decision away from you. Here's a subpoena. Now you show up and you testify, or you're going to get arrested." I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the details yeah. it, of what happened there, but it reminds me of other things. RFM, I think you covered this at one time. It was this whole uh, sex abuse case that went on for years and years in Arizona. And if we remember, the local bishop calls the uh, Curtin and McConkie hotline number, and uh, they tell him how well, to, to handle clear, it. Well, it wasn't the Curtin McConkie hotline number; it was the you know, the, the child use protection. Hotline. Yeah, 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 totally. But anyway, the Curtin McConkie yeah. hotline number and uh, the bishop explains the situation to Curtin and McConkie. They say how to handle it. And the bishop is bothered by the way that, to handle it. And he says something like, well, I think the way we should do this is this thing, which was whatever it was, it was a healthier way. Please. And if you remember right, Curtin and McConkie responded to him that if you don't do exactly what we tell you, you will not have our protection going right. forward. You might be sued and you'll be responsible for your own uh, legal services and protection, uh, getting your own lawyer. And any liability we'll that you, you might have. And the only way we'll protect you. And it's so weird. I mean, as a bishop, nobody trained me anything. I'm just a carpet salesman who's told that God wants me to be here. And the next Sunday <laughs> I show up and that's what I do. Right. And I'm handling, uh, one time I had a, a a wife come to see me who her husband put a gun on the table and told her to shoot herself. I mean, the, the things you handle and you have no training to handle it and the church just throws you in there that you don't really have 
any ability to know what is the right way to do some of these things. And then to have the church go, well, I don't care whether you think we're doing it wrong. If you don't do what we say, we're not going to protect you. It's, it's a such threat. an F it's a horrible thing to say to a lay untrained trained leader that you put in that position of liability. And he had right. no clue what he was getting into. No, well, it's the same thing. They're threatening people in order to get them to cover stuff up, bad stuff, child sex abuse up. That's what they do apparently. And by the way, Bill, what the hell did you do when the guy put the gun on his desk and told his wife to shoot herself in your office? Um, he never threatened her. He told her to kill herself. And I'm just a 29 year old or 30 year old carpet salesman trying to figure out. I, I just counseled them and said, told her that he's probably not the guy for you. He's not really a healthy person to be in a relationship with. And I told him to stop threatening her and to get some distance between him and her. And he ended up moving and she stayed and, Mm. But I didn't call the police. I didn't even know what I was supposed to do. I'm disappointed. I was hoping this meeting ended up with you standing over this guy, pistol whipping his ass. Oh, no. <laughs> I, well, I'm I think it happened I was at home, bishop. right? He had done yeah. it. it. He did he didn't it like two days before. In, yeah. No, no. He, went, he didn't bring the firearm into the bishop's office. Oh, that's what I thought you said. Yeah. No, no, no. I, he I, did I it may two be days a bit before. I just got done watching Equalizer 3 over the weekend. Yeah, she, Denzel Washington. She, she, uh, she came, she was a non-member. She came in to see me to tell me how abusive he was. And that was one of the things she informed me of was that he mm. told her to kill herself. I just want to say, Bill, just I know <laughs> you feel like you didn't do anything or like you didn't really know what to do with this. This is a tough situation. For, I didn't. That's really young. Twenty nine. But um, I mean, bishops have done much worse, you know for women in these kinds of situations, uh, you know, as far as, you know, asking if, if, you know, if she's doing her wifely duties, you know, wink, wink. Uh, right. What is she doing enough. What is she, or not doing right. that's upsetting her husband so much? Yeah. What are you doing? What's, you know, maybe you can, you know, be nicer, be more spiritual, be more sweet, you know, whatever it is um, to just, you know, protect yourself. So that that's something that we know bishops have done a lot. So I guess I just want to commend you for that. If that was a tough situation, you know, that you're right, that, that people aren't prepared for. So um, no one trained me on anything. Yeah. All right. Um, it's still not over. So it gets worse. I think this is, it does get worse. Let's go ahead um, to the next clip here. I think this is the right one. Um, okay. Yeah. And we've got another bishop now. Um, so your ex wife's attorney was a Mormon bishop, Doug Thayer. Yeah. And, and here's the crazy thing. So this case is just, you know, they just accused me of everything. He said I belonged in prison. When he read my psych evaluation, he highlighted the part that said I was scared of what would happen around children. And this is not a real private sensitive report with a professional doctor. And that one of the fears I had is people treating me different than the rest of the kids because I, they knew I had been a victim. They'd come up and said, well, that thing that happened to you at scouting, are you okay to be around kids? And I, that was super traumatic for me. Doug Thayer highlights that and yells in the courtroom, see, he's a child abuser. Look, he's scared of what will happen when kids are around. He doesn't explain the context. He made me look like a child abuser. I do what they ask me in this document. My kids and I have a normal life. Finally, it's over. So I do the stuff. I go to the parenting class. They said I do fantastic. They write a letter. I go to a psychologist. They said I had to go for the psychologist. Dr. White said I didn't need to keep going after two or three sessions. He said I had a lot of trauma from the experience, but I was really healthy and stuff. And then I went to a psychiatrist. They wrote that I didn't need all this any medication, the, that I was fine, so I didn't need to be forced to take medication. I, I had written up that I would take medication if a psychiatrist said it. So I basically graduated out of the stuff they had to, to slowly introduce my life back in the... And Claire Chadwick, it comes out in this, as we're finishing this stuff, she's not, she's not doing her part. The special master, she's not going to the court. She's not reporting it. She's not showing that it's gone through. And then she tells me that Bishop Thayer, her bishop, she she talks to me about her conversations with him, and she's repenting. This conversation took place while she was in his office in a repentance session. Bishop Thayer had a complete position of authority over her as he was talking about this court case. And I met back with her again. One, you know, there's I've got all the emails and the messages back and forth, trying to understand why she isn't doing what she's supposed to do to to get this to a judge and and correct this document. 
And then the last time I talked to Claire, she looked at me and she started crying and said, I can't, he's too powerful. He's just too powerful. And then Claire sent a letter to the judge revoking herself from our case, dismissing herself from our case as a special master. So I didn't have my rights restored through the progression that would happen because Bishop Thayer, who lied in court by not dismissing that he was her bishop, used her, sabotaged the whole thing through intimidation of some sort, probably her own sexual sins. She fell apart. I never got it. But then, like within two months, my ex-wife calls, starts treating me like I'm normal again and just dropping the kids off me. So I didn't need to go fight in court to fix it if I had my rights. She just started bringing them back. She even started bragging that I was her glorified baby daddy and I'd babysit whenever she wanted. She started traveling all over the country and, and, I, and it evolved in a situation where then I had the kids like 80% of the time for a couple of years. And we just lived like normal, peaceful life. My ex-wife treated me like I was completely normal and everything was peaceful. Until 2015, when I went to help refugees and I was gone for a little while and the kids lived in my house and the school was right next to it and the church was down. I, I came home because I heard my ex-wife was taking the kids out of the house. My parents had come and watched them. And I, I, when I got home, she was acting like she did all those years before where I was unsafe and unfit. I, I, I filed something to keep the kids from being pulled out of the home. I didn't think her life was really stable. And suddenly I went to the court to get my divorce decree. And lo and behold, Doug Thayer, all those years before in Marilyn Moody Brown's meeting, when they were printing off the final settlement agreement, he said, there's a problem with this document printing. Don't worry, just sign this cover sheet. We'll get it printed. That's the last I know of that. And when I subpoenaed this in 2015, this divorce decree, it was the same decree that he had sent to us before we had mediation. And it said that I'd signed my, and basically signed my rights away. I had no legal uh, custody, no physical custody. Had another visible reaction from RFM there. That's what happened at Enzyme Peak too, right? That they signed letters before they had all the documents and... Yeah, you don't sign things. Okay, well look, attorneys being attorneys, okay. Um, and I'm not counting this this uh, other attorney. What was his name, Thatcher or something? The bishop who was Thayer. an attorney? Thayer? Doug okay. Thayer. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if what uh, is being told about this Bishop Attorney Thayer is correct, then I'll just tell you, people have been disbarred for much less. And the second thing is, why would anybody in their right mind trust an attorney who's acted that way to act ethically when you're asking them to just assign this the signature page and don't worry, I'll put it with this other stuff, right? Attorneys do that regularly with each other, okay? Because sometimes it makes things work faster and whatever's going on and it has to be done quickly because they can trust each other, because attorneys are supposed to act with ethics and honesty to the bench and to the bar, which is to the other attorneys, right? Yes, absolutely, you should be able to trust an attorney. But then when he does something like this, it's just like, it's incredible. How do you not just go immediately to court uh, and get it changed and say, this guy schnookered me? And have him reported to the bar and have him on the hot seat in front of the judge for what he did. I just, I don't I know where does. Adam's attorney is in all this. Late. Maybe he wasn't yeah. represented. I don't know, but he should have been. The only thing I can think of is just this, this poor man has been through so much that we've just gone through and it's still under two hours, you know, and, and this has been this man's life from the age of 14 and it's and it's not just that that's in the past but like these things like the the abuse itself is coming up it's being weaponized by this attorney by Jody by his wife to re-traumatize him re-trigger him just you know like i i just don't know how much a man can go through and still i guess i could see why I could see I, I could see why he would have a slip up like this because it's just in a sea of like all of these things. You know what I mean? I just I get I just have some th sympathy for this man. This the the mental and emotional 
beatings that he's had, like almost his whole entire life, you know, to have to. It's amazing. If you watch the interview, Adam looks and acts a lot better. The further towards the end of the interview you get, like you see him, he's coming out. You know, the comment said at the beginning, like with that first interview, like this man looks shattered. You watch that interview and you will see quite a difference between the beginning and the end. And part of it is because there's power in being able to share and, and get these stories out. But also, I think Adam is an amazingly resilient person that I think um, the stuff he's been through would probably break most people if they even went through half of it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So I think I think that the fact that Adam still had even just that little bit of trust I kind of shows that when the entire world has been against him, he still has this ability to trust people. And he does now, too, still. So I, I lost I that know. a long think- time ago. I'll tell you, maybe I want to be clear that I am not, uh, I'm not trying to criticize Adam at all. I'm just wondering if he had an attorney, if he didn't, he should have anybody Mm -hmm. in a divorce where it is contested. And usually even when it's not, but if it's contested like this, yeah, you should have an attorney. And if I'm this guy's attorney and this guy Thayer pulls some kind of trick like that, I'm on the Mm -hmm. phone with him immediately. And I'm saying, look, you change that to the way it was before pal or I'll have you brought up in court on a motion to have you found in contempt, and I'll file a bar complaint against you. And I think that would have gotten his attention. Yeah. And I just want to bring up two people have asked in the chat about the settlement and like, what does he not have a lot of money for this, uh, for the lawyers? So the the amount of the settlement can't be disclosed, but he did say multiple times, and I, I maybe should have included a clip of this, but Adam did not seek punitive damages, which is what, really potentially could have got him a lot more. I think there were other victims that did go ahead and do that. But the reason why Adam didn't do that was because he was advised, he and his family, by church leaders, you know, not to go after that. And I think a lot of people kind of feel that if you go after punitive damages, this is just you kind of going after above and beyond maybe what you deserve to get from a a settlement or something happening like this that they, like you're really just trying to be greedy and get all you can get and I, I imagine that was kind of how they they made him feel so he did get a settlement but um by no means um anywhere near what the what others have gotten and so and, and this is why like he is not able to even keep up uh, with attorney's fees like trying to go through all of these things so right. i just wanted to respond to that comment so um we've got I think just a couple more clips. So we're we're almost kind of to the end here, and then we I can give some more updates um, if there's any questions in the chat about it that maybe I haven't um, answered. So any any other comments before I bring it back up? No. Okay. Well, I find myself over here trying to calm myself down mentally because I'm getting so worked up about this. Yeah. Yeah, it was really a tough. There were a lot of people who said they had to take breaks watching this interview and and come back to it, and it's understandable why. So, here we go. I was trying to fit in and live my life, and during that time, I was just actively trying to get back into BYU. Finally, my dad organizes the honor code files with the emails, puts together such a compelling argument of this how damning BYU is. Uh, for this situation that, I mean, it's just completely damning the ethics. And I drop them off in, in the the president's office at BYU and Jan Sharman, the vice president, calls me in personally. So I'm finally, somebody's listening. And she says, we can do this the legal way with attorneys and then we can't talk or we can talk through this and I'll help you. So I'm just like, you know, Let's let's talk through this. I just want to get back to school and just be able to move forward. And we get talking, and she lets me know that um, part of my stip conditions and I my emails to them was that they had to fire Ed Morin from the honor code office, get these dangerous people out of there. And and she lets me know that she she said it in terms like this: I've removed Ed from that office. We've transferred him to a different job where he can't hurt anybody with this stuff or work with people in this manner. She goes, but we're not going to publicly say that or anything because we we don't want that to happen. You know, we don't want to hurt BYU and I'm agreeing. And part of the talk, I said, well, if I sue the university, I said, 
would the settlement be tithing? And she said, yeah, it would be tithing. Oh, now all of a sudden it is tithing. No, it's, yeah, it's I interest on the proceeds. It's the richest <laughs> church in the world with like a hundred. Wait, did you say something, RFM? I think it was where what John went to. No, it's not tithing. It's interest on the investments of tithing. Right. It's convenient right. when it's tithing and when it isn't, huh? Yeah. When it's a mall, it's not tithing. But when it's a settlement, it's tithing. Yep. Hmm. Sorry, let me go back here. I was trying to fit in and we sure. can't talk or we can talk through this and I'll help them move forward. And we get talking and she lets me know that um, part of my stip conditions when I my emails to them was that they had to fire Ed Morin from the honor code office, get these dangerous people out of there. And and she lets me know that she she said it in terms like this. I've removed Ed from that office. We've transferred him to a different job where he can't hurt anybody with this stuff or work with people in this manner. She goes, but we're not going to publicly say that or anything because we, we don't want that to happen. You know, we don't want to hurt BYU. And I'm agreeing. And part of the talk, I said, well, if I sued the university, I said, Do, would the settlement be tithing? And she said, yeah, it would be tithing. Oh, now all of a sudden it is tithing. I didn't, of I didn't know that tithing. this was the richest church in the world with like <laughs> hundreds of billions of dollars. I'm like barely living rent to rent, working on tractors and people's yards so that my kids can sit in the tractor with me because I don't have the money for a babysitter. And I, and I have like $100,000, $150,000 of attorney fees I still hadn't paid at that point. You know, I didn't want to take tithing money. That I thought was to help women, the sick, the afflicted. You know, I, I thought, okay, I'm good enough. I'm strong enough. I don't need this. And she said she'd take care of me. She called me in like two more times, like an hour at a time to make sure everything was okay and get this all ready and said I could come back to school. I'm thinking I got a full ride scholarship. They're going to pay for room and board. They're probably going to give me a cash settlement to help me because they understand. I showed in the documents just the part of my custody case, attorney fees for how the honor code stuff had to be discussed, how much that affected the case, all this stuff that was separate from what would have been a normal divorce, the, the thousands and thousands, like $40,000 of attorney fees wrapped around the honor code stuff or something like that, that I had to pay. Uh, and, and not the time I lost with my kids or anything. I'm thinking they're going to help me. Gets ready for school. I'm still living paycheck to paycheck. I can't. I can't afford my tuition. So I got my temple recommend. Suddenly they give it to me and I can't afford tuition. So I just couldn't go to school. So I, I finally could go and then I couldn't afford it. So I didn't have a babysitter. And I now the kids were, I loved them. I won't say they were dumped on me, but I didn't have any any way to take care of these two little kids other than just to stay home and take care of them. And this was all tied to Hillam's passing, is that correct? Well, this stuff all suddenly changed and I made legway that I could suddenly get back into school and get a temple recommend just shortly after uh, Elder Hillam passed away. So I wanna go over some comments that I, um, I started. So this one is from MP Indy, I think is how it is. It says, um, and, and this was kind of going back to the set settlements, and he was never going after money. Um, their comment says, all of which makes him a far more powerful spokesperson because he cannot be assailed for seeking money in this. And in a way, he still was, you know, that that is something that that people have and, and do say about him. But um, but yeah, by not seeking the punitive and stuff. And I think it's really interesting. Again, this just shows his character that when he has like you know talking with BYU he just wants the people who hurt him to be removed from the positions they have the authority and the ability to hurt other people every single step of the way throughout everything he's done every step he's taken like his, his family fighting the the legislature his family deciding to go ahead and sue boy scouts you know after after the um, man had already been arrested it's always been because he's thinking about other people and even at back at the beginning that when he went to camp he was trying to get out of camp and then this guy was starting to groom his younger brother so he goes to camp it's it's just amazing Amazing what a pure and beautiful soul this man is. 
And the fact that he still trusts people, I guess, to his, his detriment, unfortunately, but it's just the fact that BYU can't even fucking let him finish his education. I don't, I can't answer why he still wanted to go there, but it's just, I, I just can't believe that they couldn't even just do that. It's, and they, it's they can still make it right. They can still make it right. BYU, yeah, LDS Church, pick up the phone, pay college for the guy's kids. I mean, do something. Like, like you can right wrongs. It, it's this whole idea of Elder Oak saying that uh, we neither ask for nor do we give apologies. Right? It's the same sort of idea. You, the church could right its wrongs if it felt guilty for the shit it's done for two hundred years. It has plenty of money to start to make it right. Yeah, it, it would be one thing care. if it was like what he thought it was, just like a, a poor church just trying to do what it does, you know. And when when they say it's tithing, and as much as he's been through, he's thinking, no, I it would be wrong for me to take that because tithing is for other people. It's it's for women or children or people like in, in desperate need. I'm strong. I can handle this. You know, I'm OK. He's still like just so selfless and in, in all of this. You know. Anyway, um, I think there was another thought that I was going to. Oh, yeah, this is another comment I'll, I'll bring up. Sorry, I just, I think, Bill, you put one up. We can put it back up. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. You can, I didn't mean that. So go ahead and put yours up. Oh, no, that's fine. So this is from Coco B. This was the number I had in my head. Coco B says, didn't they say some other boys got 20 million in punitive, in punitive damages? That is the figure that was in my head. But since I didn't have it in front of me, I, I didn't want to say. But um, But now that someone else is saying it. That does confirm what I had in my head that other boys that did seek punitive damages for the Boy Scout uh, camp abuse uh, got that Adam and his family did not get because they did uh, they listened to their leaders to not go after that. Remember so, that um, the Boy Scouts of America had to file for bankruptcy and that the LDS Church had to pay, I think, uh, a quarter of a million or a quarter of a billion dollars in uh, settlement uh, amounts due to all this Boy Scout church abuse that was right. going on, it, it it's not a small drop in the bucket. This was serious stuff, and it was hundreds, if not, you know, more. I remember the news reports about that $250 million figure that the, um, the LDS church was in for in the proposed settlement, but apparently that blew up. The LDS church withdrew and decided they would deal with it on their own. That's my recollection. Yeah, there was something where somehow the court system said they weren't, offering it was decided it really wasn't a fair amount and they had to go back to the table i, I think, think they, what it was was a provision that the lds church wanted in there that extended the waiver against the lds church right because when you, you settle a lawsuit right the I other party so. has to sign a, a release and a waiver that they're not going to sue you again for anything related to all the stuff that you're settling that makes sense right but the lds church wanted not only a waiver as to uh, Mormon men in the Boy Scouts who may have been victimizing other Boy Scouts who are members of the church, but they wanted to extend it to the young men's program and to church organizations other than Boy Scouts. And I think that's where the judge right. balked and said, no, we're not doing that. That's my recollection. And I think if people, yeah, if people want to look more, the Mormon stories covered this pretty extensively, and they had attorney uh, Tim Tim Kosnoff on who has who's been involved a lot in these cases representing victims and um so i would look back i think episode 1644 is one of them there were we did multiple during this time covering it and and tim kosnoff is somebody that is not mormon but has because i think of these cases has a, a grip on mormon culture and doctrine and and society the way that most outsiders can't ever achieve no matter how interested they are in us no matter how many youtube videos they watch no matter you know there's, they just can't achieve it just because of the insularity of, of, you know, cultures like ours. But Tim is one of these that, that gets it. And he has some really, you know, harsh things, but he, he came on specifically to update and explain and talk about these things. So if you're wanting to have a refresher to, or try to find that, I, I know that, you know, we have a, a, an involved in, attorney that talks about and, and goes into that in more details. So, um, yeah, he's in, he's in almost everywhere that these, these kind of Boy Scout abuse cases are talked about. Um, I want to show another, 
uh, quote this one, just like BSA, move them somewhere else. That's what BYU did. You know, this is referencing back to him just wanting people out of positions that they're hurting other people. Um, but no one ever fires them. They always just move them somewhere else. And I, I actually want, I wanted to talk to you about, so I think most people um, wouldn't necessarily have this much effort behind them to destroy their lives. You know, I mean, Bill, you were excommunicated. You, you put out, you know, it was, it was your podcast with the Holland liar, liar, pants on fire. I think everyone knows and understands that was the catalyst for you, uh, to lose your church membership, but the church isn't doing to you what it's done to Adam. And I no. think, I think because of this, it's the Boy Scout stuff. I think it's the legislature, right? Because, all right, the, the, the lid was already starting to pop off on Boy Scout abuse. You know, it's just one of those things that it would hit the news and then kind of fade out and then come back in the news and fade out. And then, you know, eventually it just it just blew up, right? So Adams was not the first case where, like, cover-ups were starting to be found out, you know, but it was a pretty big one. And especially combined with the legislature removing the statute of limitations, I I can just imagine that Adam has cost this church who knows how much money mm -hmm. all since then and all the legal fees, um, at not just the PR and the bad reputation and and everything, but because like changing that statute so that you know how many more victims were able to come out now. And the church had to know that. That's, that's why there was such intense opposition until they couldn't do it anymore without being shown to be, you know, what they were doing. So they they had to flip, but they had to know what was going to happen. And I can just imagine. And again, I do think probably with Hillam, it was probably taken incredibly personally. And that and and that's he just dogged him the rest of his life. So I I don't even know what Hillam probably got from the church higher ups you know, from this, you know, over this, but definitely, you know, and then unfortunately for Adam, that like, he still believes for so long throughout all of this stuff, you know, and, and it's that belief that also continues to give the church power, you know, uh, up until this point to, to continue to extract a very, very terrible price from him for, for what he cost the church. Yeah, I don't think he ever realized, I don't know if he's realized yet, that by making the church look so bad and by not following their commandments to him to shut the hell up about it and to not talk to his parents about it, he did the opposite. And he made the church, church look really, really, really bad. And he became public enemy number one to the leadership of the LDS church. Absolutely. Or at least maybe to some of the leaders maybe to Elder Hillam. Right. And I just want to give a, a quick shout out to Adam's parents for doing for everything they've done, because unfortunately, how many parents don't stand up for their children? Mm -hmm. You know, as, as Elder Corbett advised, you know, in, in his talk against activism towards the church, even for your own children, you know, to not. Uh, Adam's uh, father, this was obviously well before that talk, but uh, Adam's father was near retirement. He was near retirement age with CES and, and resigned and, and gave all that up to stand up for his children. And not just that in the in the last clip, and that was the last one. So there, there aren't any more clips for the night. It was Adam's father here again. And I mean, he's here throughout the whole process. Obviously, I, I want to point that out. And he was also targeted by Jody as, as she did also try to paint him as like a dangerous, unstable person as well. But um, he's the one that puts that file together for BYU <laughs> and that all he has to do is drop it off for him to get that phone call from, you know, from the VP. So uh, Adam's father is just on it. And I, and I assume his mother as well. Um, yeah. So shout out for that. And then, um, let's go to some updates. So I guess uh, I'll say this real quick. Bill's got the call-in screen up on the studio. So if we're, we're, we are taking calls now, the line is open. And uh, while those calls are coming in, I'm just going to go ahead and give some uh, some updates. So, And some are from the comments. So this one's from Daisy May. She says, Adam posted today or yesterday that this has been healing for him, and he's feeling very happy. Um, someone else uh, about their, oh, Coco B, totally resilient. He has such strength in just hanging on. I'm so glad he has a wife who stands by him now. 
Um, and I feel like at this point in the program, I act, I feel I kind of failed. This has been a really tough one. And I, I, I had thought of this and I didn't write it down to, to keep it in my mind, but I, I wish I had some of the positive clips that we could kind of end on that um, because yeah, Adam is incredibly resilient. So as, as shattered as he looks in the beginning, uh, by the end, he's laughing. He's uh, he actually told a joke that had me like having a heart attack behind the scenes because at, it's at the very end of the interview when John thanks him for coming for that first interview and then and being willing to come back again, you know, for the live one. Um, Adam says, "Wait, this this was live," and it, especially with so much traumatic things being shared, like the, the thought for just a moment that Adam didn't know that this was being broadcast at that time to uh, thousands of people. I I had almost an instant heart attack and then he just laughed and he was like, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And I, I'm sure John DeLynn too probably like had a moment there where his heart stopped um, like mine did, you know, but that's, that's who Adam is. And there was a, a, a lovely part where he talks about his, his current wife and um, his child that he has with her. And uh, it, was, it was basically a nephew to everyone else. He's, he's like, I'm happy with my wife. I have a child. I have a family. You know, you, they, can't, they couldn't take that away from me. And I think as, as much as we see maybe how Adam's uh, resilience and his willingness to trust leadership in the church has it kind of allowed him to continue to be victimized. It's that same trait that allows him to be where he's at now to have met another woman that, you know, not just have gone the route of like, all women are like this, you know, they're all man haters. They're all take everything from you if they can. He's, he's in another relationship and he has a child and he's loving being a father and he's there for his, his other kids with Morena. And this is something that people have asked about before and they might be asking in the comments. Sorry, I haven't been keeping up. He does not still have, as far as I'm aware, uh, legal custody of his older two children, but he is involved in their lives from what I understand. Um, so there's still some kind of things that play there, but uh, Adam loves being a dad and he, I, he found being able to do this to be more empowering. And I think this, um, so I just, I just wanted to put that out there and you, you really should watch the full interview uh, that comes out. And, and there was another thing, one more thing Adam said that I really appreciated uh, was when he talked about, um, um, now I'm going to mess it up, but he was talking about things that people say about victims, that that they're destroyed, that they can never be happy again, uh, things like that. And while he says, yes, this has affected me and it will affect me, and in many ways it did destroy me, but not to a point where life's not worth living and that there's not um, you know, great things to happen. So he, I, that was a really positive message, I think, that, uh, you know, for other victims like himself. So, and I doubt many have gone through um, what he has. So that's my final, I, I think, word on that. And I think, Bill, if you've got calls, we can go there. Yeah. I wanted to just share one quick thing before we go to the first call. Adam's parents, in light of the things that this church teaches when your loved one starts to, um, speak up. <clears throat> so I remember the talk Elder Christofferson gave about the Amish stuff. And it's such a weird talk because on the front end, he shames the Amish for shunning. And then on the back end, he counsels Mormons to shun. He says, yes, the cost of joining the church of Jesus Christ can be very high, but the admonition to prefer Christ above all others, even our closest family members, applies also to those who may have been born in the covenant. Many of us become members of the church without opposition, perhaps as children. The challenge we may confront is remaining loyal to the Savior and His church in the face of parents, in-laws, brothers or sisters, or even children whose conduct, beliefs, or choices make it impossible to support both Him and them. It's not a question of love. We can and must love one another as Jesus loves us, He said. And then He goes, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if you have loved one to another. But the Lord reminds us that He but. that loveth Father, right. But there should not be any but after that sentence, but I knew but, it was coming. The Lord reminds us, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So although fam familial love continues, relationships may be interrupted. And according to the circumstances, even support or tolerance at times suspended for the sake of higher love. I've, I've experienced that quote. Um Kudos to his parents for putting his well-being 
and his trauma in front of this church that not only asks you, not only requires of you, but demands of you under covenant that you choose it over those you love. All right. I've got another right. comment here. Please. Sorry, real quick. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, I, I don't remember if I commented this earlier when I meant to, but it says another awesome thing was his volunteering in the Middle East. And he, he did mention it briefly in one of the video clips. But yeah, that was something that I just thought as well. Like this man has been through so much, but then like, and you know, and then this is where his wife steps in to start making more problems with him. Like he's helping refugees, you know, like he's just, I, I don't know, just seems like a, a really cool guy. So, all right. Awesome. Okay, uh, for, I just got one call in the call bank. There's two more empty lines, folks, if you want to call in. If anybody has a personal story of something that happened to you that uh, happened with influence of some sort by higher leadership in the church or higher leadership at a church college, uh, we'd love to hear from you. But folks, anybody's welcome to call. There are two open lines as of right now. 662-667-6667 is the phone number. It's up on the screen if you're watching the, the show live. And uh, our first call, uh, I don't have a name. Caller, what's the, what's the name? My name is Ryan. Oh, give me one second, Ryan. I got to see if why you're, let's try that. Okay, let's try that again. Ryan, go ahead, my friend. You're on Mormonism Live. Hello? Hmm. We heard him before. Maybe he was. Yeah, yeah I heard him. It was on my, it was on my yeah. phone. Um. Ryan, I'll just I'll just leave my phone here. Go ahead, my friend. Um, yeah, I was just as I've uh, learned about uh, Jody and especially in Adam's interview, I saw a lot of stuff that he was talking about with um, the way um, Jody worked her therapy, and I saw it was very similar to what I experienced with the therapist I saw while on my mission. Um, she was, of course, the therapist that they sent all the missionaries to. And while she wasn't as severe, um, it was very similar in that I am very certain she was talking about my case with others. Um, I know that there was definitely two times where other people reported back to her. Um, I don't know. I don't have solid evidence, but I'm quite certain she was talking to the mission president about my case. Um, I also have reason to believe she talked to um, my companions about me. I don't know the full detail, but I'm very certain those kind of communications were going on. I never gave any um, release or anything to say that she could do that. I didn't even know what was going on until after the fact, really. Or in the cases where I do know people were reporting to her, it wasn't until I was in session with her and she said, oh, I heard this from them. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, I just want to say that like that kind of stuff seems to be the norm. Like this isn't just especially Jody. in the church. Yeah, yeah. Thing we're talking I, I think about it's possible. In the cases she was doing what is normal. Yeah, in this case, is blown. You know, this stuff's blown wide open now that it's documented that this seemed to be a pattern of behavior uh, from her and and that whole practice. Uh, go ahead. Maybe. And I know you said you don't remember uh, signing anything, um, but I think um especially when missions are really controlling but i mean for sure when bishops refer to jody and and i've used um I, i've had a bishop's referral for therapy before you you do sign a waiver and they kind of make it sound like not that big of a deal you know so they won't share everything you've said but they can share some things so this is something that's really common in the church period um if you're if you're trying to go through your bishop to get some therapy they they do have you sign something that allows them to be able to report back to your bishop at least some things and i imagine that if it wasn't right then that maybe other paperwork you signed for your mission or something like that probably technically uh, you know i i just feel like i because I, I also did talk to um a therapist uh well it was actually it was supposed to be a, a physician um for a, a health problem that i was having that just wasn't resolving and then it eventually it was I, you know a typical woman it was it was all in my head right you know anyway so i i know that was something that also got passed around like between my mission president and and this doctor that was like yeah maybe she's just stressed and that's why this is happening you know anyway i'm sorry that happened to you but i i absolutely believe it it's definitely another problem that the church has uh, period
RFM is going to share something here. Please. Yeah. Thank you. I will. Since you asked. The problem I see over and over again from Roger Clark with the um, EPA from all these stories that I'm hearing is that the church has a real problem with its professionals who are employed by the church following the standards and ethics that apply to that profession. It seems over and over again that they are only too willing to breach very fundamental ethics and standards that apply to their profession when they are told to by church leaders. And that's a real problem. And it's not just that, but it's also the the flipping of the rules for for thee, but not for me, right? The church has no problem knowing your deepest, darkest secrets, your psych evaluations, you know, child abuse, or if you're if you're asking for financial help, like getting into your finances, sitting with you once a year, asking if you've you've paid up your proper amount of tithing, you know. But um but when you have a spokesperson on TV trying to talk about the hundreds of billions of dollars you've been hiding from everyone, you know, or even on tax documents, we feel like we don't need to share that. That's a good point. Yep. By the way, on a smaller scale, remember how many years ago was it? It wasn't that many years ago when it was November and President Nelson came up with a great idea of challenging all the members to write on their social media every day something that they were grateful for up to Thanksgiving. We went back and checked on their uh, President Nelson's. I don't think he did one day. None of the apostles did it every day. I think the one who did it the most, I can't remember, was it um, Elder Gong who may have done a few days? Yeah, but it's Elder amazing. Did too. You know, it's, yeah, it's, they, they challenge yeah. President Nelson challenges the members to do this, and he doesn't do it at all. He doesn't even try. He's totally do what I say and not what I do. And yeah, I'm just I so that frustrated that like so many of the leaders can stay in the dark. So, I mean, even with that, like following their own advice, but just, yeah, the privacy and just the amount of things they're able to do behind the scenes. And, you know, nobody knows. You know, the SCMC may not even be following this program tonight because they may have more important matters they're dealing with. Yeah. I think are. PR at the church for sure is also incredibly busy at the moment. So, yeah. You wouldn't know what to look at them, but I, I think that they're probably burning the midnight oil. They've got a few things to respond yeah. to, don't they? A little bit yes, going and on I'm not trying to change the subject here or anything. No. I was just thinking when I said that to President Nelson, you know, that he doesn't do what he tells other people to do. And that makes me question when he tells people, oh, I just spent, you know, the last year or how many months going through every scripture in the topical guide with Jesus about Jesus. Yeah, I don't. I have trouble believing that now because you've proven yourself to be untrust, untrustworthy in doing what it is you tell people to do after the fact. Why should I think you're any more trustworthy in doing what you tell people to do before the fact? Well, RFM, he is the prophet and he's closest to God. So maybe it wasn't as important for him. Maybe he's kind of achieved this level already. And uh, it's more for, you know, the little people. But speaking yes. of level achieved, I guess I did just want to just do a, a a recall or, or a shout out that of course Hillam and Clywig uh, had their second anointings. It, it's I think Clywig mm -hmm. was invited by Hillam. I, I think certainly uh, Tom Christopherson, the one that kind of blew open the second anointing stuff. I think Hillam was his general authority too. I Tom I'm Phillips. Tom not Phillips. Sure Tom, on that. Tom Phillips. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, wrong wrong Tom. Tom Phillips. I think it was Hillam. I don't know, maybe the chat can can correct me. Probably they might know, but I, that's what's in my mind. So, of course, you know, all of these men, um, you know, they, they already got their golden ticket. So, mm -hmm. well, there's a reason I haven't been excommunicated, but I'm not going to share it with you because you've covenanted not to. I didn't say <laughs> that, Bill. You said that. <laughs> all right. right. Um, this is I think oh, this will be our last call for that. I know it's just one other one, but um because we're having an issue. Hopefully this works this time. Caller, are you there? Caller? Yes, yeah. this is Swanee. Sony? Swanee, hi. Swanee. Swanee. Oh, awesome, Swanee. Yeah. How I love you. Hey, How I love you. <laughs> I'm doing Can you turn on the TV right. in the background? How are you guys? I'm going to... I do, and yeah, I'm stepping in the other room, yeah. so we can't hear it. Gotcha. Go ahead with, uh, go ahead with your right. thoughts. 
All righty. Uh, we know that after the Marriage Equality Act, the adoption program through Family Services was shut down. Does anybody think that uh, the mental health support program will be shut down due to class action threats? What are y'all thoughts? I don't um, think so. I, I, my understanding is that part of the reason I think there was also more just just kind of like the the Boy Scouts or you know the church leaving Boy Scouts supposedly, uh, you know, over allowing mm -hmm. girls in and and you know really had nothing to do with uh, the impending explosion of uh, media attention and lawsuits around you know Boy Scout settlements. It's kind of like one of those things. So suppose the 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 PR or what I understood that the the church got out of the adoption, but basically when um. Uh, when gay marriage was legalized because they wouldn't have a standing for not allowing gay couples to adopt. But, I, you know, mm -hmm. obviously there were a lot of other problems behind the scenes with LDS adoption services anyway. So I think it was just kind of like a good excuse to get out of something um, that was already quite bad. But that's that's all the information I have mm -hmm. on it. So I don't know if we're quite at that level where I think the church should be motivated mm -hmm. to keep having their own mental health professionals despite how bad Jody makes them look because there are some that really do try you know they're not they're not all like her uh, even though they are expected to in the church violate at least some or certain ethics the church i mm -hmm. think can't afford to have its membership go to non mormon you know therapists ethical therapists that they're not in control over Right, Which whose is foremost why, you know, goal is not to keep these people in the church. Yeah, I agree right. with you. They need to keep that. They, and the pro I'm sorry, and I think Swan, I think the problem is is that it is laudable that a church organization or any big organization is going to provide some kind of system for mental health care for its members who need to access those services. The problem that I see over and over again mm -hmm. is that the LDS church will set up these laudable kind of programs but they can't seem to resist the temptation of subverting them to their own purposes i don't think right they, they really and could um so many is jody oh go ahead no, no, no swanee it's your dime go ahead go ahead yeah yeah Maybe. go ahead swanee you go no I, I'll, I'll talk after they sent so many to jody if she is sent to jail um, I just find it hard to believe that there's not some legal recourse for the people that were harmed by Jody. And who's going to pay for that? Um, insurance? I, I mean, you like know, a, like maybe a class action suit or something. I don't know. RFM yeah, is that a possibility? Or, or just. Usually class actions are for small amounts that don't justify its own lawsuits. So you get a bunch of people together. Um, mm. They don't have to be, mm -hmm. but but if the church like in its that. official capacity and through its official officers are sending people and referring them to an individual who works for the church and screws them over in this way, yeah, the church can be sued and should be. Absolutely. Yeah. I just, um, you know, I... From the different podcasts, it sounds like they've sent so many people to Jody's program. And so I was just curious because uh, she's gone and no one else can come along. But hey, thank you guys so much for your great program. I look forward to every Wednesday night. And I just really think the guys you do, the work you guys do is top notch. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks so much, Swanee. I think it must be almost 11 o'clock at night where you are. Oh, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's Thank you for it. staying up late. Thank you. You guys have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for Bye. calling. I just wanted to say that I don't think uh, the church ever really could have um, a relationship with ethical therapists because there's just so much about the church itself that's so damaging. So. Uh, I think any therapist worth their salt would have to point out the ways that the church is damaging individuals, their psyche, marriages, et cetera. 
So I, I just think it really is utterly, truly impossible, I think, despite the church's best intentions, as it is now, to bring on board ethical professionals or, or allow them to practice what they're supposed to, to the full extent. Do you yeah. guys remember when, when Kwaku kind of, um, at the Midnight Mormons or, or Ward Radio yeah. Ward accuses Radio. like people like you guys or John DeLynn of like destroying marriages for profit? Yes. Did you, guys, did you guys catch how much Jody was making per month on some of these therapy sessions where she was destroying these marriages? Like, and not just marriages, but men's lives and careers and reputations and everything. Yeah, it was, it was a lot, thousands. right? It was, yeah. it was, yeah. I, and there's different, but I think two to 3,000 is a, is a figure that I've heard a lot. It's, I just think that's a little bit ironic. It, yeah, to it Quaker's is. Comment, and that's the damage the church already causes, you know, the church already does a lot to really ruin these kinds of things. So anyway, yeah, to, just had to point that to, out. To Quaker's comment, I mean, pretending that your magic spell makes somebody eternally married for all time and eternity while in the mortal life handing out tons of trauma, unhealthy mechanisms, patriarchy, sexism and abuse. I'm confused at how the church gets a free pass on doing what he accuses the rest of us of doing. It makes, makes little to no sense to me. Yeah. But I guess that's pretty normal for ward radio. Psych ward radio, please. Yeah. <laughs> I bet we're only two and a half hours in. I was, I was so worried as I was preparing like with commentary and with some of these like clips, I, I thought that, um, I know I was worried about maybe making this the length of the original. So and I'm, I'm pretty pleased that we came in this. And I still think I, I covered most of the big clips. So, um, and I have seen a lot of support in the chat. So I, I just did want to say, I'll, I'll go back and, and read these after, but thank you all so much. You've been saying some very kind things and, and also a lot of support for Adam as well. I don't know if Adam will see this. I know it can be really re-traumatizing to hear or rehear things. I know like when he was, you know, in studio for that second half of the interview, um, well, he wasn't in studio. He was outside kind of taking a walk until, um, till John let him know that that part was ending. And then he would come back inside because he didn't, uh, he, he didn't have the ability to, to have to, you know, listen and go through that part of the interview again. So um, mm -hmm. I don't think he'll be watching, but I, I hope he gets um, all the support and love that he needs. So, yeah. yeah if you are watching Adam, I wish you all the very best and future happiness with your new family. Yeah. So. Kudos to you for your courage and bravery, ma'am. Anything else, Maven? Otherwise, great job. Yes, great job. everybody. Let's have That's applause. Yeah. Can everybody stand up where you are right now? And let's all <laughs> applaud for the great job Maven did. Yes. I can hear you from here. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Great job, Maven. I don't know if you're ready to close up, but we will be back next Wednesday. Same bad time, same bad channel. Yeah, we'll see what we're going to be talking about. Thing. I'm sorry. You okay, should, you, you have you asked. have the last word, last and you give thing. us the outro. Okay. The, the outro, this well, just the last thing is I hope that we can all not just uh, really take uh, our examples from Adam at the, the personal cost and the sacrifice uh, it, it, in spite of amazing odds to try to make the world a better place. And especially for children, I know that's something that I got out of this. I feel a renewed sense of, of really attempting to try to change things as, as bad as things look. And so I, I hope everyone else will too um let's make adam kind of our our rallying cry and our banner and and keep fighting like he has to do the right thing and to really hopefully we can really overturn uh big institutions in this country and really start making a change moving forward because adam has shown that it absolutely can happen so i hope you guys will all join me in in really trying to take after that example and we'll see you guys again next week same time same place love you all Mormonism Live, better than touching your own little factory.